the assertive type of negotiator, it's really more important to them that they felt that they conducted themselves respectably, that you respected them, and that you knew what they were coming from. One thing that's more important to them than actually getting what they want is... So how do you deal in a negotiation with the kind of person who has to win, who has to get everything they want, they're very controlling, alpha, right? and it's their way or no way? Well, getting everything they want is actually third on their list. First of all, being in control is number one on their list, and that's emotionally satisfying. Mm. The second thing is the alpha type, which is, uh, we refer to that as the, the assertive. The one thing that's more important to them than actually getting what they want is being respected and making sure that you know everything about what they're coming from. So, and it's a classic guy who's working for his boss and said, you know what, my boss didn't do what I wanted him to do, but he heard me out, or she heard me out. Mm. I can live with the direction that we're going as long as I know that my boss knows my opinion. And so that the assertive type of negotiator, it's really more important to them that they felt, felt that they uh, conducted themselves respected, respectably, that you respected them, and that you knew what they were coming from. Mm. And once they know those things, they'll actually soften up on what they want. If they feel disrespected, they'll probably be more frustrated and angry and right. demanding. Right, 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 right. So you have because to Because when they're very demanding, what they're really saying to you sub subtly is, I want you to know how important this is to me. Right. I want you to know how important I am. So, so how do you meet that person? Just come to them with respect or with yeah, calm? And, and, or you, know, you could say, look, you're, you're, you're impressive. You're phenomenal. You've thought it's all out. This is very... Yeah, I mean, clearly you know where you're coming from. You know what you want. Um, I'm lucky to be talking to you at all. <laughs> right. I mean, if were I to sit down with, with Donald Trump, I would, in fact, be lucky to be in the same room with him. That'd be the first thing I'd say to him. I'd say, you're, Stroke his ego. you're an American icon. Right. You know, you, you're the symbol of American business, certainly in New York City. Yeah, you know, stro stroking her ego is not a bad thing. One of the, one, and, it, you know, it's a version of empathy because that, that's how they see themselves. Mm. And, you know, the, 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 the emotional recognition, like emotional currency is not going to solve every deal. I just don't want to try to solve any deal with money when I could have solved it with emotional currency. I'm saving mm. my money. With emotional yeah. empathy, currency, intelligence. Right, yeah. right. My money's too important to me to waste it when I could buy something with satisfaction. Mm. So, yeah. I like I mean, that. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm enormously tight with my dollars. And so many people, well, are, especially men in business deals, I feel like there's a lot of alpha men who are trying to get what they want. And so somehow they'll they'll lose money because they're not able to have empathy or they're not able to whatever they're yeah. not able to drop their ego. Yeah, a lot a lot of a lot of money's left on the pay, on the on the table over stuff like that. Mm. Or what they value themselves out. Like price is the most price is the most emotional term in a negotiation because you value yourself based on price. But if I can get you to value yourself in another way, it put you on a magazine cover. I mean, it, Stroke the ego in some other way. It used to be you get Donald Trump in any magazine you wanted to if you put him on a cover. You know, imagine the amount right. of time, and that used to be his deal. If you wanted to do an article on Donald Trump, the deal was he made the cover. And and then he would knock himself out for the people doing the articles. Oh, yeah. On access. Anything. Answering questions. Yeah. Imagine how valuable his time was. They got to cover it to the magazine anyway. They got to put somebody on it. Right. You know, now they're trading something that costs them nothing. Right. And he's giving them s dynamic interviews. And he's promoting them hard and he's sharing them with everyone. Yeah, he's exactly framing right. it everywhere. And yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so you, you know, you're buying Donald Trump with emotional recognition. Uh, so, what are the characteristics that make a great negotiator in your field? And also, how do those translate into the business and relationship world? Just in general, outside of... Well, let the other side go first. Um, you know, most people have are so... so they're, they're burning with their argument. Here's why you should make this deal. And they've got that memorized. And, and they're not going to listen to a word you say till they get it out. So trying to talk to them is really like trying to, to talk to a paranoid schizophrenic. Right. Because they're rehearsing their speech in their head and their logic. And so they, they just... You just can't get through to them. Mm. So you let them go. You let them go first, and 
Um, uh, another guy, Ned Coletti, uh, former GM of the Dodgers, friend of mine here in town, phenomenal negotiator. Mm-hmm. He's ne- lectured at uh, at my class at USC also. You know, and Ned always likes to let the other side go first. You know, he, he did the Barry Bonds deal. He's done a ton of deals across the board. And Ned says, well, you know, in a two-hour phone call, there's going to be 90 seconds of solid gold where my the person I'm talking to, based on changes that they made in their tone of voice and the adjectives that they used, I mean, he's got an instinct for it. He couldn't, he couldn't identify. He just always said there's 90 seconds of solid gold. And I'd say, what is that? <laughs> right. And we, we'd talk it through. And he says, well, yeah, it's going to be a change in the tone of voice. It's going to be a different kind of adjective. So Ned wants you to go first because he wants to know what it's going to take to make the deal. What they want. Right. Yeah, what, what, they, what they're burning them. for or how they characterize what they have. Mm, or what they're not saying too, maybe. Exactly right. What someone has failed to say is often a lot more important than what they have said, which is why you give it a little if, if thought in advance. All right, what, they're gonna, what are they going to say if, they, if they've got this? So I, I actually like to look for more of what they haven't said what's glaringly missing and that's going to take i'm going to need you to walk through it a couple of times before that jumps out of me Mm, okay okay um who are the most difficult people to work with then would you say it's the alpha people or would you say it's the uncertain people or what type of people are hard to work in negotiation with you know you're talking about a little bit of a tight match and that, that has a has a tendency it's a little bit based on how bad i want to make the deal like i don't like liars hmm or I don't like the most difficult people to work with in the long run are people who haven't thought anything through, which is as bad as a liar. Only their heart's not in the wrong place. They don't know what they want right. specifically, or they don't know how how they're gonna they don't know how they're gonna get this done. Which is again, we go over and over again. I go over and over again. Yes is nothing without how. Like and the person who thinks like yes is gonna make a deal, well yes is not gonna make a deal because you got to have how. Mm. How are we gonna put this together? And someone that doesn't think things through a lot of times, they're actually kind of dysfunctional on their own side. So they'll make promises they can't keep, and they have no idea they can't keep those promises. Right. And so when they take your deal, you think you've done a deal with them, they take it back to their company, and their company goes like, no, we're not doing this. This is a stupid idea. We can't do this. Sure. And that happens a lot. I think in in a private sector, I've heard from a number of companies that fully 50% of the deals that they make that don't go through get killed internally because somebody cut a deal for them and they took it back to the company. And the company mm. says, no, that, that violates our terms and conditions. Right. We can't deliver on that basis. So you're dealing with someone who just has no, uh, doesn't have a clue as to what's going on on their side. Sure. There are a lot of people like that. When you're making a business deal, what do you recommend as the amount of time to consider the deal before saying, yes, let's do it? Like, um, here's the deal points. Here's what you want. Here's what I want. Okay, should we sign it right away? Should we give it 24 hours? Should we take it to our team? Should it be a week? You know, what's like kind of a standard, you think? Um, in, unless you've got something in line a, a ahead of time. Um, the, the company name is the Black Swan Group because we believe there's black swans in every negotiation, which is something you didn't know that as soon as you found out, it's going to change all the parameters. The deal. Gotcha. So you sit at, down at the table to find out the unknowns. Huh. And... You, it's impossible to research all the unknowns. Plus, a lot of the unknowns, I'll find them a lot faster if I just ask you. Right. And I could research for two weeks something that I may be able to get you to tell me about in 10 minutes. For example, what do you mean something you'd want to ask? Um, I'm, do, I'm uh, speaking to a long, for a long-time client, and they have another co- firm that I've been affiliated with coming doing a different block. When I found out they were doing that block, I could subtly reach back through my network to find out what the, the competing slash partnership firm of mine is, mm. what they're charging, or I could just flat out ask them. Well, I need to get the information. A lot of information you got to get by not asking. You got to trigger it. The, you know the the phrase "ask good questions." It's really get good information, and a lot of times you won't tell me stuff if I ask. But if I act like I already know, or if I, there are other ways, hostage negotiators trigger information without asking questions. And hostage negotiators get that information and make you feel good about giving it at the same time. Mm. So give me an example, either in a hostage or a business deal, what that 
kind of trigger could be? Well, it's gonna be it's gonna be some sort of a statement. I might say, look, I'm I'm sure my my competing company's charging twice as much as I am. Oh, and then they'll tell you the answer. They want to correct me. Oh, actually, no, it's the right. same. Or actually, you're getting a better deal. Never underestimate the huh. other side's desire to correct you. Wow. Because it makes people feel powerful and smart. You know, you're going to want to feel smarter than me. One of, one of my clients is negotiating a deal for uh, a commercial office building in South Carolina. And it's uh, it's almost 100% occupancy. It's in a mixed-use uh, historic area. So it means the, the building can't be knocked down and nobody can build it because it's a historic area. Mm-hmm. And so the building's basically impossible to replace, and it's 100% occupancy. It makes no sense to sell the building. So they're genuinely thinking, why is the seller selling? First of all, you can't ask why, because why makes people defensive. If I look at you and I say, why did you wear a black shirt? Your instant thought is going to be like, do I got to defend the black shirt? Why I'm doing it? Yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> you need to find out why, but you can't ask why, because it makes people defensive. Huh, so what would you ask there? Well, then again, you don't want to ask at all because if you're smarter, you change your white whys to what's. And it's more likely they'll respond if you say, you know, what's making the seller want to sell? So, you know, what is causing them to do that? Mm -hmm. Not why are they selling? But instead, what my student did was he said, well, seems to me the seller's selling a cash cow because of a disbelief in the market fundamentals and the future of of the building. No, let me correct you. This is why I'm doing it. Exactly. Huh. And the other side went like, no, 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 they, they, got, they got a couple buildings that are underwater. Now, I, don't, I can't imagine a real estate agent answering that question ever. I mean, this is, this is highly confidential. All right. Prior to, you know, my seller is desperate for money is, is what, the, what the answer was. But because it was a correction and people love to correct, they'll correct you without thinking it through. It's an involuntary response, a desire to sound smarter to right. than you yeah. and to be right and wow. correct you, which is a burning desire in most people because it makes me feel smart and more powerful. Mm. And I'll seize every opportunity to feel smarter and more powerful you at the table. Gosh, it's like and, chess. Uh, it's emotional chess. <laughs> emotional chess. I love this. It's emotional chess. And how do women and men compare as negotiators, as counter as Counterpowers either against each other or woman man, woman woman, man see, man. Is there a difference? See, I think a powerful woman negotiator, a woman who's really good at negotiation, is almost unstoppable. Wow. Um, and I think that the reinforcement, the societal reinforcement, is constantly trying to pound men into being better negotiators and constantly trying to pound women away from it. And I think that I think the um, the step from sympathy to empathy is a shorter step. And women are socialized to be sympathetic. And I don't think they're, you know, whether or not it's nature or nurture, I know there's a lot more pressure societally and culturally culturally for women to be like that. And in my class, women pick my style of negotiation up faster than the men do. And the women go to my class, start cutting bigger and better deals faster than the men do. In business or in life or in just... In both. Gotcha. Wow. So in 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 my view, I like, think that like after they graduate, they go on to do well in the class. Okay, you got you got to negotiate with skin in the game in my class, and really? almost all of my students are rising star business executives. So um, mock negotiations they're making more is what you're saying. No, in real life, man. Real life, you got to take, take it out my stuff world. and put it in real life. Why you're in my class, and you got to write about it. Wow. And uh, one, you know, I've got everything from a billion dollar Wall Street transaction. People in my class use the tools for. I get a, a USC get a lot of commercial real estate state transactions. Wow, a lot of people buying commercial real estate that are that are working on MBAs. I've gotten a lot of those transactions. Got uh, you know my favorite my favorite way to say no, which I got you know the how question before. Uh huh. The favorite way to say no is how am I supposed to do that? Just real calm deference. There's great power in deference. You know, that's, and that's what I did in kidnappings, bank robberies, everything. How, how am I supposed to do that? And what if they say, I don't care, figure it out, or she's dead? Well, then you know that you've pushed them as far as you can, and that means you've got to pivot to something else. Now, the, and, and that's actually where you want to get to because mm-hmm. the strategy of negotiation is to find out you want to max every term if you can. And the only way to max that is to find out that I've hit 
you to the full limit without making you angry enough that you slam your hands down and walk away. Because mm-hmm. even your reaction or just you now. Or you shoot someone. Or you shoot someone. Your reaction to this now is like, look, you got to do it or things are going to go bad. Yeah. And it was uh, one of my one of my uh, students here in town is negotiating for a uh, uh, for a luxury client for, to rent a house in Hollywood Hills, and you know, twenty grand a month was a rental. Mm. And they uh, were trying to get the rental, or they were trying to lease. Trying to get it. Gotcha. And so the uh, person said it's twenty grand a month. Right. Yeah. And 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 it's from a very well. His client's extremely wealthy. So that, you know, and you're negotiating a wealthy market. The other side always thinks you got all the money in the world. Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, he just said, how, how am I supposed to do that? And they said, okay, well. And they shifted the terms, and he cut the price, and he moved a bunch of other terms around. Then they negotiated for a while longer. And then he said, again, on the price, he says, how my client, how's my client supposed to pay that? And the realtor says, if your client wants a house, he's got to pay it. Bang, you got a deal. When the other side says, if you want it, you have to do it, mm-hmm. which will come af- usually after the second, third time. That you said, how am I supposed to do that? So you knock it down a little more on a car, a real estate deal, whatever it is. Now, now you've maxed that term. Now you move on to something else, so you make the deal. But you needed to know that you pushed them as far as you could have, mm-hmm. without them storming out, or without them saying, "Chris Voss is not any fun to deal with. I would never do business with him again." They, how am I supposed to do that in a deferential way? Right. They still feel in control. They're not, you're not saying, screw you, that's too much. Like, what are you out of your mind? You know? Right. And if you don't make the deal at that point, then what they say after the fact, they say, you know, uh, I didn't make a deal, but I deal with them again. Mm. You know, they're, 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 all right, they're all right to uh, to deal with. Did they get the lease? Did, how much did they get? Yeah, they got it. How much, you know? Uh, they they knocked it down to less than 20, and then they got some softness on some other terms. Gotcha. And, and then, they, then they cut the deal for the house. There you go. And I wish I was paying 20 grand a month for a house. <laughs> That's a lot of money for a house. 20 grand a month. Wow. That's a rich a rich student. Yeah. Well, <laughs> USC, they get, you know, oh, people true. that are involved in a lot of lucrative deals. Yeah, yeah. So... You're saying, what is the importance of empathy in a negotiation? What I'm hearing you say is is extremely important. And that's why you feel like a woman would be a better negotiator in general because they have more empathy in general or? Well, it's the shortest. Most people have confused sympathy with empathy. Okay, what's the difference? Um, Empathy is I can see you're upset. It's just identifying how you feel. Uh, Sympathy is like, wow, I feel bad for you. Mm. So uh, feeling sorry or bad for someone is sympathy. Sympathy. It's it's it is in fact in view, it doesn't help anybody. Like I don't care if you feel bad for me. Right. <laughs> I could care less. So sympathy is not a good thing. Sympathy is a weakness as a negotiator. As in a negotiation. Empathy is a good thing. Empathy uh, and tactical empathy because okay. we've really taken a pass just empathy in general. Mm-hmm. Like we've been doing this long enough that I know what I'm looking for before we sit down. I know that. I need to find out the stuff that are negative emotions for you because I need to get them out of the way of the deal. And I need to find out the stuff that are positive emotions for you because I want to reinforce that to make the deal. And I know that the negatives are going to be a bigger deal to you than the positives are. So can you give me an example of this in a business deal? What that would? Well, if I, don't, if, I don't, if I don't like doing business with Donald Trump at all, then if, he get, if he's annoyed me to the point where I get enough satisfaction keeping money out of his hands, I won't make that deal. Mm. Or if I'm in a business deal where where the other side, and and I've thought about this, like you annoy me so much. (laughs) That I don't want you to get anything. That I'll take less money to keep you out. Right. So how would you eliminate something like that, that negative in the deal so that you could? Well, then then say like, if I think that you're negative towards me, I'm going to say, look, I'm, I'm sure it seems like I'm greedy here. If I say to you like, I'm sure I'm going to seem very greedy here. That sets me up to ask for a lot of money. Mm. Because there's actually um, science that backs this up now. Identifying a negative diminishes it every time. So if I'm going to make a big grab for the money, you're going to think I'm greedy. And I need to get that out of the way because if I'm too greedy, Mm. you're you're going to get some satisfaction by keeping me from the money, even if you don't get any. Right. And so th- I'm going to say, look, I'm going I'm to seem real greedy here. I'm going to seem like I'm very self-centered and that I'm greedy and that I'm not looking out for you at all. And then I'll just let it sit. And you'll take a lot more from me. 
a lot, a lot. You, you'll allow me to take more if I've said that in advance. Up front, really. Yeah. Because I've, I've diminished that. Your, your thought is like, I mean, how, I, I can never seem too greedy then. When mm. I make that grab, you're right. going to say, well, he was honest with me. He told me he wanted a lot of money. He didn't try to say, hey, look, let's do a win-win deal. Now, give me all the money. Right. Because if I say I want to do a win-win deal with you, I'm like, hey, I'll be nice to you. I'll look out for you. And then when you try I to take 90 grab, and give me 10. It's like, right. oh, it's not a good deal. Yeah. But when you say it up front, then you're more likely to get the deal. Yeah. And get more of whatever you want. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seem very honest to you. I'm gonna, you you're you're going to like that I was honest with you. <laughs> and you're going to say after the fact, like, look. He was honest. I always knew where he was coming from. I didn't like the deal, but I did it anyways or whatever. Yeah. Huh. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's That's this, this stuff that we found out that works regularly. We had uh, talk about another one we talk about in the book. Uh, there was a multi-million dollar deal going down in Washington, D.C., the subcontractor was very unhappy with the general contractor and a female negotiator, and they were getting ready to lose everything. And they sat down and they said, you know, I'm sure we seem like the big guy that doesn't care about you. I'm sure we seem like the big general contractor that's trying to take complete advantage of the sub and not appreciate how hard you're working for this and not care about your future at all. And she turned that deal around. When she was done, she took an additional million in profit for herself <laughs> and her company. And the other side liked them more. So not only did they increase the profit, but they had a better relationship. This is why being honest up front or empathetic or I can see how you might feel that we're going to do this. It's a tactical approach. Wow. There are negatives here. We're going to address the negatives. Up front. And we're going to make them go away. Yeah, wow. address them up front. Most people don't want to do that. I already did that. Do you know when I did that to you? When? I've already done it. Remember when we talked about doing the one-on-one -on -one role play? Yeah. I said it was going to be horrible. Oh, that's true. You said it up front, yeah. And I always I always do that every single time the same way because if you do the role play with me, no matter how it goes, I, you know, you're going to feel like you were beaten, beaten up. Right, but at least you told me I was going to be. Right, and you can't come out. That's if I say it's going to be horrible, you, know, you can't ever say, well, he sandbagged me. You know, he caught me off guard. Right. And then, then what I always do, then I, I diffuse the negative and then I pitch the positive. And most people pitch the positive and hope the negative will go away. They sandwich the negative. Positive, yeah, this, negative, positive. The same, I don't like sandwich at all. Start with the negative. Start with the negative. And I said, and you will learn more than anyone else. What would you say then are the, the three biggest mistakes you see a lot of people doing in negotiations? Trying to uh, club somebody with their leverage. Um, yeah. Explaining. You know, I got to go first. You know, I got I got to set an anchor out. You know, this a anchoring on price or terms is just such such a bad idea, and so many people love to do it. Can you give me an example of what that means? Um, like if I if I know I want to pay a hundred dollars, and I'm saying, look, the best I can do is like twenty five. So, you know, and you know, the, you go to the side on the open market. I want to pay a hundred. And I want you to work me up there. The real problem with extreme anchoring from the beginning, I think all seasoned negotiators have learned, it drives deals from the table. Mm. Like, I don't want to miss out a deal because my extreme anchor on the price of the terms at the beginning was so extreme mm -hmm. that you're like, I can never come close to this. When we should have made the deal. We, sh we should have figured out a way to work it out. Price doesn't break deals, doesn't make deals, it breaks them. Mm. You don't make a great deal based on price. You can break a deal on if price. If you try to undercut extremes. Right. Somebody's going to get mad and they're going to walk away. Uh -huh. you, you know, you're going to get a, you know, heck with you. I don't, you know, you, you insult me with that offer. And they just don't realize how many deals they drive away from the table. Interesting. If someone wants to get a better price on something. So that, that was, I think, the, first off, before I ask that question, that was the second, I think, mistake is there another big mistake people make in negotiation? The price, extreme price anchoring, using too much leverage to try to club someone. Was there another big one? What a lot of people do that's actually taught out there a lot, um, which is really bad, is continue to ask for stuff after you made a deal. Like ask mm. for free stuff. That's the worst, right? We people, made a good deal. Hate it. Here's a win-win. And now you're now, asking now more. Now you're asking for and more and more. It's going to make leave and a sour taste in someone's mouth. That's every time. Oh. And that's taught out there regularly. Really? It was, you know, there's a negotiation guru from the 80s, and I can't remember what he called it, but he gave the example. 
you go out and you get a custom made suit. And you've made the deal for the suit, and one of the guys measuring you, you mm. say, So, how many free ties do I get with that? And he said, That's a great way to get free things, free little things, after they made the deal. Throw in a pocket square, throw in a couple ties, right. throw in a couple legs, whatever, whatever. whatever it is. You know, what, and what that does is make the person you did it to hate you, mm. which they're going to resent it. And if they have the opportunity to fail to comply with any term, they will do that. Now, unfortunately, that's taught really extensively and it's done in business all the time. Mm. People call it scope creep, feature creep. Interesting. Like it drives every single business person crazy because they don't know how to deal with it. Now, in a black swan method, you know, you might say, if you were good at how questions, you might say, how can I give you free ties? and continue to want to do business with you. Mm. <laughs> you know, how can I be a great tailor for you if you ask me for free stuff and it cuts my margin? Right. You know, make their pro what they ask for the obstacle to what they want. Either what you want is a path or if what they want is bad, it's the obstacle. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I serve the needs of your family if you're cutting into my profit margins? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's got to be a way to wake somebody up to it because a lot of people have been taught that they don't know any better. Like if I'd have stuck to that training that I learned from this guy back in the 1980s, I'd have thought it was okay because I'm getting free ties all over the place. Yeah. Like a lot of people, um, if, they, if they don't know any better, how do you wake them up so that if they only knew, they'd change? Mm -hmm. Now, there's some people that are doing it on purpose. If you do something like that to me because you didn't know any better, let me see if I can wake you up. If I can wake you up, awesome. We've got a great long-term relationship. If I can't wake you up, I now know. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably like, okay, cool. This is the last deal I make with this guy. One and done, yeah. This is a one and done. I'm out. Mm -hmm. But I need to know if, if you just did it by accident. I got job negotiation. Recently brought somebody onto my company. Thought we had the deal settled. And the new employee. New employee. Yeah. Because uh, employment contracts like any other. And this person brings up a bunch of other stuff after we've laid out the terms, we've written the offer letter, we sent the offer letter. Offer letter doesn't get signed. Silence. Not a good sign. Mm. My director of operations, who knows no oriented questions, shoots this person an email, have you given up on signing the offer letter. Mm. Immediately comes back with a bunch of, you know, not ridiculous uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. More asks. More asks, yeah. which are not on a plate. Some of them are like, wow, that was interesting. I never thought of that one. Now nah, we can't do that, not in a million years. This is stuff I aspire to. But not you now. We can't yeah. do it now. But no, this is, I like this one. It's just not in the package now. But my director of operations is like, I never had somebody come back. And I'm like, okay, so first I got to do is I got to find out, did she, this person just not know any better? So I engaged in the conversation and I said, all right, so however this goes, I want you to understand two things. First of all, I'm glad it came up now as opposed to six months from now. Mm -hmm. But secondly, this is a bad habit to bring stuff up after the deal has been cut. So... I'm guessing you just didn't know any better and you were uncomfortable bringing it up. Right. But if you come on board first, you got to understand we don't do this to people. And you got to learn we work all the little stuff out before we think we have an agreement instead of going for little stuff after the agreement. Right. And this person was like, hey, you know, I didn't know. And my intention is to help build the company. Right, and right. I appreciate you letting me know. And I understand where you're coming from. They were genuine about it. They yeah. were very genuine. Yeah. I needed to know that. Yeah. Like, was is it, was she was this person advised to do this? Mm -hmm. Did they do it by accident, or did they do that because this is going to be the predictor of future behavior, mm -hmm. which now we have a real problem, right? Because if <laughs> this is a habit that you're born with, you are not going to last, and you can't represent me. No. Because the people that work on my team are also my ambassadors. Mm -hmm. I got to find out which one it is. And I go back and we talk it through. 
and we settle everything out. And I got a list of things to aspire to for employee benefits because these are great things. Sure. So to finish that up, one of the worst things you can do is ask for more and more and more and more things after the negotiation has been agreed on. Right. Do that before the final agreement is what I'm hearing you say. Yep. Yes. If someone's looking to nice buy- Nice paraphrase, by the way. <laughs> I want to make sure I <laughs> capture that. If someone is looking to buy, wanting to buy something, acquire right. something, whether they're buying a business, a car, a house, um, some potential expensive item, a jewelry, something of, of more value than $1,000. And they, they might be able to negotiate a lower price. You mentioned the extreme price anchoring, how that is a mistake, right? There's a house for a million dollars. I'll give you 200 grand for it, right? right, that's, right. That's, but you want to get a better deal. Right. Maybe it's a Rolex. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's a house. Maybe you want to acquire a business, whatever it is. Something right. of higher value. A ring, an engagement ring. You're going to marry someone. Right, right, right. Let them make their profit off somebody else. Yeah. What should be the lower percentage on a, a higher item of value? How, what should the initial offer be? You want to get a better deal. So you don't want to pay a million dollars for a home, but you really want the home. You don't want to pay 3000 for the diamond ring, the engagement ring, but you really want that ring. Right. How low of a percentage should you go to anchor in order for you to feel like, oh, I got a great deal and I got the thing I wanted, and they didn't get screwed over. You know what I mean? Well, it depends upon the context. I mean, like thirty percent is a good rule of thumb to start at. Well, for for a target, like if you if you and again, very very context driven. Sure. Like for example, I'm in Macy's one time and um, picking out this jacket. Girl I'm with really likes it. She searches the thing extensively. She finds like a thread out of place. Mm. And she goes like, watch me get 10% off on this jacket. And I'm like, <laughs> threat. I can get 30% by being nice. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. Well, I, like in, in every transaction, you know, I look at it as an ag- there's an aggravation tax. Now, the person that you're dealing with has already built in the aggravation tax because of all the aggravating people that have come through the door ahead of them. So there's an aggravation penalty, there's an annoyance tax, there's an aggravation tax that's already there on a price. Now, if you're not aggravating, you don't need to pay the aggravation tax. Interesting. Let somebody else pay that aggravation tax. And you so, benefit from them actually paying that, that tax. Yeah, yeah let, some, let somebody else pay it. Um, if I'm not aggravating, why should I pay the aggravating tax? So, <laughs> you know, this young lady, she'd gotten 10% off on a regular basis. I will be demanding 10, 10% is the annoyance tax when there's another 20% to be gained. Mm, interesting. Like you don't, so many people don't realize how much money they're leaving on the table. Really? Like massive amounts of money. On, on any given, the difference between 10% off and 30% off. Right. Like they got a way to give you a better deal mm-hmm. if they feel like. So how do you get them to feel like it? Well, so yeah, great. There you go. Exactly. Again, the approach very similar to the hotel thing. You know, there's a, there's a there's a strategy where we sort of bundle the skills in a black swan method. We call it the accusations audit. The accusations audit. Accusations audit. Let me do an audit of all the names you would call me <laughs> if I'm going to do this. Uh huh. You say this. You say it to yourself. Okay, not to that. Because I need to come up with a list. Uh. So, again, it's like, look, you get annoying people coming through here all day long, every day, want something for nothing. I'm going to look like just one, like another one of these annoying jerks. It's really demanding and rub you the wrong way. And don't appreciate how hard it is for you to work in this jewelry store, this car dealership, this wherever you are. You are knocking yourself out. A tough sales job. Mm-hmm. You're trying to feed your family. People are coming here trying to take food out of your mouth. Because how do they see it? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not about you. And it's not about, it's really not sympathy. You know, the difference between sympathy and empathy. You know, I feel your pain. Right. Like, I've been there too. You know, like, I'm a regular guy like yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, don't give me that regular guy stuff. 
So, but you, you look at people like me, you want something for nothing who come walking in all the time. You know, you look at us as, as wanting discounts and, you know, and you're trying to feed your family. Now, suddenly, this person is like, oh, wow. They get it. This is not the yeah, other yeah. annoying jerk that came in here. Now, now they're starting to open up. And then, you know, you talked before about being playful. Being playful about this can be a really big deal. I, I've gotten so many things for free for being playful or upgrades or discounts just by, let me just say, a friendly joke or just something funny. Right. You know, let me just be goofy and dance in front of them and be like, what is this guy doing, you know? Yeah. You just got, you don't got to pay the aggravation tax. Yeah. And then plus, see, Sean says you're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind. Not only have you put the person in a better mood, you now got them thinking about options. Mm. What can they do? What, you know, how can they help you? What can they get away with? How can they shortcut the TSA line? How can they, um, what's the code for the employee discount? Like I, you know, in this, this same place where I'm, where I'm trying to get this 30% or so off, and I'm joking around with this guy. Sure. You know, and, and one of the things, get him to see as a human being, I'm like, well, I'm Chris. Is there a Chris discount? What kind of Chris discount is there? <laughs> and they laugh at that. And so, and, I, and I'm still not getting enough of a discount, and finally I go like, look, give me the employee discount. Mm, and I've you? been joking around, and I smile when I say this. This guy goes like, if I give you the employee discount, I gotta pay for this thing myself. And I go, I'll pay you back. Yeah, yeah. And I'm laughing and he laughs. And so he looks at the machine and I says, wait right here. And he walks around and I see him and I walks up to a person and I perceive to be the manager. And he's whispering to the manager's ear. And I see this manager standing there going like, no, no. No, really? No. And he comes walking back and another employee <laughs> intercepts him, whispers in his ear, and I see his eyes light up and he walks over and he plugs in a discount for me and we get the 30% off. Wow. But I was joking with him. I was showing I knew what it looked like from his perspective. I'm getting myself out of this aggravation tax thing. Mm -hmm. You know, let somebody else pay the demanding, aggressive, mm -hmm. annoying tax. Mm -hmm. You go in there and you brighten somebody else's day up you leave the world a better place. You get some practice in because mm -hmm. you want that confidence for the big negotiation. Right. And all these things work for you. And you are you end up feeling better about the day yourself. Yes. You get a fun interaction. And yeah. You got a discount. Exactly. Do you practice every day? Any on any transact? I mean, any financial transaction? Are you practicing? Even if it's a cup of coffee, if it's uh, the gas station, if it's a hotel, it's a plane. Any. Are you always pricing? It's a perishable skill. And me and everybody on my team, if we let ourselves get out of practice, we get rusty. Interesting. I'm really used to my no-oriented questions. That's pretty much all I ask. What questions? Uh, no-oriented, where I'm trying to get you to say no. That's what you do. ridiculous you're idea? That. You're pricing that constantly. Yeah, I, keep that, I keep that teed up constantly. Is it a ridiculous idea is kind of your go-to? Yeah. Is it a ridiculous idea for me to get a yeah. 30 employee discount today? Yeah. And so depending upon my daily interactions, I get so caught up in my world that I don't get my practice in. Mm -hmm. And so like huh. when we started traveling in right after the pandemic, I'm getting ready to go into a hotel. I haven't done a hotel upgrade in a while. And I almost talked myself out of it. Really? I am, I'm, oh, this, you know, amygdala's kicking in. Uh -huh. It's not gonna work. I'm gonna embarrass myself. I'm tired. Yeah. I, can, I can see this guy turning me down. I mean, I literally stand outside the hotel and I go, ah, 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 all right, all right, you can do this, you can do this. Come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And I, I got to psych myself up because I'm out of practice. Yeah, but you're the guy. That's right. Everybody, it's perishable mm. for everybody. Uh -huh. It ain't. It is not riding a bike. Yeah. And then you also got to be willing, like, not, if it works nine times out of ten, sometimes you don't get anything. Right. Uh, hotel I was in recently. You know, my read of the guy is you run across deceptive people that are not there to help you, that are not gonna give you anything. And through the course of the interaction, I get several very strong reads that this person was that minority that we're all afraid of is the majority. They're a minority and they're there. Mm -hmm. And so that interaction was, all right, so my read is this, this, and this. 
Now I'm smarter. I see this guy coming farther away. Like Conor McGregor. Uh -huh. You know, I win or I learn. Sure, sure. You know, you win or you learn. Now, I'm curious. When you go into a store, a hotel, a, you know, airport, is it, and there's multiple options of people to talk to, who you would buy from or get upgraded from. You know, yeah. There's two people at the counter. There's three people at the store. Are you assessing first who I should approach based on body language, based on if they smile, if they're, you know, in a more positive state? Or is it depending on male, female? Is it, no, are you, do you have a success rate based on, is it just more an intuitive feeling that who you walk up to? I, you know, I hadn't thought about that before. What I'm really more worried about is what kind of vibe I'm putting off. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't have a lot of control over who I'm going to get. In point of fact, they're reading me before I start reading them. Because, you know, they got, they got a revolving door. They're picking up this energy. I think there's actual energy there. It's one of the things I bounced off of. Andrew Huberman, mm -hmm. you know, is the is the energy actually there? Interesting. And he's like, the data doesn't support it. I suspect it's possible. Uh -huh. And he's a very data driven guy. Very. He's solid, solid science, solid science, peer reviewed journals. Yes. He's like, the data ain't there yet, but I think it exists. That's Chris Voss saying that, not Andrew Huberman. Andrew didn't say that. He didn't say I think it exists. Chris Voss says I think it exists. These people behind the counter, they're picking up on my vibe. So I, what I got to do, instead of sitting there like, I want this guy, I want this guy, I want this guy, I might be putting off a bad vibe. Mm. I need to put off a relaxed vibe. Yeah, just like go I'm, walk right I'm up. I'm not and... in any hurry. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm cool. If I'm looking at them, I got to make sure I'm looking at them and my inner voice is saying, like, take your time. I know you guys are busy. Right. I can't look at them like, do your job. Yeah. I'm standing here. I'm a customer. You should be waiting. They're going to pick up on that if that's my inner voice. Mm -hmm. So I got to get my inner voice in a place where I'm giving off a positive vibe. Relaxed, positive. And then, then I'm going to roll up and I'm going to do, I'm going to do a read on the person in a moment. Mm. You know, if they look like they're having a bad day, I'm going to say, tough day. Um, I'm, I'm hitting the reads on the TSA people all the time. Really? For practice. I do, I do a misread on a TSA guy. Don't remember what airport I was in. I ended up in an unexpected negotiation on the phone 15 minutes later. Because of the misread, I looked at this TSA guy, and he just looked kind of blank. And I said, tough day? And he kind of went, hmm. And then I went, just another day, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, just another day. But that little read is like stretching before going in the game. Mm -hmm. And the conversation I had 15 minutes later, which caught me off guard because I did the read earlier, was a really successful conversation. What was that conversation? I needed a favor from somebody. What I did, I said, am I offending you if I ask you for this favor? Because I needed him to go out of my way for me. Uh -huh. And I did the no oriented question and I did sort of, you know, what am I going to do if I ask him? I might offend him. I'm doing an emotional read. I throw the two of them together on the spur of the moment, which is really kind of where you want to get. Interesting. You know, you, you play the same notes over and over and over and suddenly you combine them in the moment. That's pretty cool. And that's why I work on my no oriented questions all the time and I'll do a random cold read, the TSA guy. My favorite one, I, 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 I've always got a bottle of water in my bag. I, for, I forget to pour out the water. TSA New Jersey. I got a New Jersey uh -huh. TSA guy. They don't put up with is nothing. A, is a, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they get the water, and they're, they're taking my bag off to the side. Now, they could almost walk me back out to the curb because the line is so long, they're through security. Mm -hmm. And the guy's got the bag. And I realize I, I don't want to spend another 20 minutes in line. So I go, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> and he walks, and he looks at me, and he walks, and he looks at me, and he goes, how long since your last confession, my son? Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you know what, an hour ago. I'm screwing up all the time. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, he, uh, he took the water. We poured it out. He's not supposed to pour it out. He poured it out for me. He turned around and walked me back, cut me in line in front of everybody else, wow. put me right back in the thing. It's just, yeah, I'm taking care of this guy. It's okay. And it put me through. What are the most common negotiations that everyone goes through on a daily basis? Wow. Any, well, anytime uh, somebody has got the words I want or I need, 
coming out of their mouth, you're in a negotiation. You're in a negotiation. Right. The commodity that's always at stake is time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm in a negotiation when I check into a hotel because I want a free upgrade. Right. Or typically I'm in a hotel early and a lot of hotels want to charge you early check-in fee. Well, I don't want to pay that fee. Right. Or a late checkout. Or late checkout. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to give late checkouts to anybody that's not one of their super executives. I'm, I'm always pushing for that 3, 4, 5 p.m. late checkout. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, they could do that for you. Yeah. If they felt like it. You know, never be mean to somebody who could hurt you by doing nothing. Mm. Well, everybody you interact with could hurt you by doing nothing. Which, if you take the flip side of that coin is, they could do something for you if they felt like it. Right. How do you make them feel like it? Demonstration, a little bit of understanding. Recognition of them as a human being. Let's go back to your Starbucks example. You're trying to show them that you're not treating them as a clerk behind the Starbucks counter, that they're actually a human being. You Mm -hmm. say their name. Hey, how you doing today? And it's not that you're saying how you're doing, but I guarantee you that the way that you say that is you're saying it in a way where it's my intention that for the brief moment that you interact with me, at least your day will be better. Yeah. And their gut instinct is going to pick that up. Mm -hmm. So the minute you're no longer demanding, now your little uh, negotiation with a Lyft driver. Is he going to, is he going to come out of the Lyft app and go into another app that is even faster? Is, is he going to, is he going to drive the slow lane the whole time? Yeah. Or is he going to try to get around the traffic to save you a few minutes? Mm -hmm. Is he, the Lyft driver, he or she, are they going to make some extra effort for you? Yeah. You know, there's a million things everybody could do, no matter how simple the job is. You uh, talk to a woman that uh, probably about three years ago, she said, you know, we buy music for movies and the people on the other side are just order takers. It's not a negotiation. Yes, it is. The way you interact with them on that phone, if they write down which song you're after with Sony or whoever it is, do they take your order and they walk it down to the hall to the guy who executes? Or do they put them on a bottle of pile because they didn't like the way you spoke to them? Right. You know, there's a million and one things people could do for you if they just felt like it. Right. So if on a regular basis you're trying to give somebody a nicer day, you're going to turn around and they will have done something for you for free. Yeah. And then stuff accumulates. What's the, what's the formula or process to get people to do things just because they feel like it? Well, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's going to sound stupid. Yeah. <laughs> smiling, being smiling. nice. Yeah. So, smiling, uh, neuroscience behind a smile. If you smile at somebody, you actually hit their mirror neurons. You start a smile in their brain. Wow. Smile is an involuntary response. A mirror neuro- neurons. Mirror neurons in their brain. It's the same as if the doctor hits your knee with a little hammer and your, your leg kicks forward. You didn't choose to have your leg kick forward. It's an involuntary response. So if somebody sees you and you smile, you've instantly hit their mirror neurons, you started a chemical change. Now they might fight it, and sometimes you get to get them three smiles. <laughs> right. But by a third smile, you get them smiling too. Yeah. So you've already started the process. And then uh, your inner voice betrays your outer voice. When you say how are you to somebody at the Starbucks, your inner voice is saying, I'm trying to make your day better. I I I I want you to be a happier person. They're going to feel it. If your inner voice is saying like, how are you today? I need my Starbucks coffee and I need to get out of here and I hate this line and I hate how long you guys... If that's in your voice, they're going to feel that. They're going to be pouring decaf in mm-hmm. instead, of, instead of the other kind. Right. So your entire approach, the neuroscience shows us the person is picking it up mm-hmm. and responding. And so your, your body language, your tone of voice... The greatest negotiators in the world really maximize that mm-hmm. because it's an invisible skill. Yeah. But it's a skill you can teach, it sounds like. And learn. And learn. You can teach it. You can learn it. You can practice it. All you got to do is get, you get, your, repet- get your repetitions in. Um, uh, John Foley's a Blue Angel pilot. I heard him speak about four years ago. He talked about how long does it take to build a habit? How much training do you need? He called it grooving a... Uh, putting a groove in your brain. The Blue Angels, you know, they got to build their habits before they get up in the sky, otherwise the jets crash. I was in a Blue Angel two years ago. It was crazy, man. 
That had to have been an adrenaline it ride. Was cr- I threw up twice. In the play. <laughs> <laughs> I was sick the whole time and sick for three days afterwards. I've got a weak stomach, but uh, it was unbelievable at the same time. They needed to know what they were doing. Oh, for sure. They can't learn up there, it's right? Amazing to watch them so close, just like feet away from each other. At, at, at Mach 1 or however fast Four they're going? Four or five, whatever. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. All right, so Foley said, how do they get that good? They practice, he said, 63 to 64 repetitions to put it in your brain. Mm. And um, another guy wrote the talent code, Daniel Coyle. Yeah. Um, he, he talked about perfect practice. Yeah. You could go excruciatingly slow as long as you do it right. And the first time you try any skill, you probably go slow. Yeah. You come to one of uh, the training sessions that my company puts on, I'm going to say, say this word for word. Take your time. Mm. And then react in the moment. We have a, one of the negotiation tools is what we call a label. When I say something to you, I want you to label it. I don't care if you have to stare at me for 10 minutes. Label it. Label it. It seems like, it sounds like, it looks like. A label is a verbal observation. Okay. But I need you to use those exact words. And if I say, I love teaching negotiations. Now, label my emotion. Your emotion? The emotion that I displayed when I said, I love teaching negotiations. Label that. What do you say, the three things? It, it seems like, it sounds like, or it looks like. Label Say that. all three of them? It, pick one of those three. Say, all right, I'm going to say it again, and yeah. I want you to say word for word, it sounds like, and then fill in the blank. Okay. I love teaching negotiations. It sounds like you love teaching negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's enough. Now, to start with, what just happened is you demonstrated it perfectly. Okay. Because the important part is you have to say the first three words. Mm. That actually like. fires the brain. Mm. And you did exactly what I thought you would do. We just said it sounds like you fired the brain and then you opened yourself up to whatever your brain put in. Mm-hmm. That's why I wanted you to actually say the words, it the actual like, specific words, yeah. because your brain will kick into gear and say something. Huh. Now, your, your first <laughs> label, every time you fire the synapse, you get a little bit better. Mm. There's a substance called myelin. Your brain wraps a substance. It's an electrical synaptic connection in your brain. And anybody, you know, if you know anything about electricity, every time you insulate it, it fires a little bit better. Mm. Fire it 63 to 64 times, according to the Blue Angel pilot, and you get a nice circuit built, yeah. and it'll fire quickly, and then you'll start to hear it. So we'll fire it again, okay. and I want you to label it again. I love teaching negotiation. Sounds like you love teaching negotiation. All right, now dig a little bit deeper. Explain so, it more? No, no, no. Just another label, but use another oh. adjective. It sounds like teaching... You, you, Sounds like X. I love teaching negotiation. It sounds like you're passionate about There you go. See, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> now you came up with another word. Uh-huh. Now it stumped you for a second. Yeah. And you you kicked in, you you know, you you let that supercomputer come up with another word. Uh-huh. And like, yeah, I am passionate about it. Now, interestingly enough, this is a way in a business negotiation. Mm-hmm. Because a great business deal is an alignment of core values, just like a great personal relationship is an alignment of core values. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting on a on a on a plane flying in here this morning. I found out more about the guy sitting on a plane next to me than he's told anybody in 20 years. Mm -hmm. With this same kind of an exercise, what do you do for a living? What do you love about it? And when he when he tells me, I now know the guy sat next to on a plane. He's got an adopted daughter. Uh, she was adopted when she was six months old from China. His mother struggled with uh, bipolar manic depressive. She committed suicide at age 17. Mm. He was raised by his grandparents. His grandfather survived the depression. His grandfather, at one point in time, going into the depression, owned 11 banks that all went bankrupt. He had to start completely over again. His grandfather used to tell him, mm. I lost 11 fortunes. His grandfather loved to live off the land. They loved to they loved to make things by hand. This guy's a very successful contractor here in Los Angeles now, mm. and he's constantly 
constantly, constantly working on improving himself. Um, married to his first wife. Uh, they're, they're business partners. They work together. They work in different aspects of the business. I mean, I've lost track of the number of things I found out about this guy. I know, I know about this guy from when he was three years old <laughs> to now. Now, in the space of what sounded like a normal social conversation, I know this guy's incredibly loyal. He's very practical. Mm. He's very hardworking. He, I just, I just flew in from Vegas. He was in Vegas because he was in a competitive poker tournament. Mm. He likes reading people. Mm. He's a very hard worker. From what I know from this guy, from what this perceived social conversation, I know that we could do business together. And if we run into trouble, I have a pretty good idea of what to expect from him and how to deal with those problems if we run into trouble. Wow. With the very sort of thing that you and I did just now. Wow. You know, you start so when he, teasing when you ask, stuff out. So when you ask him a question and he says something, you would use one of those responses. It seems like, let, it yeah. sounds like, what was it there one? Yeah, or it feels like. It feels like. It looks like. It could be it looks like. Because like, I, I might be reading your body language. It looks it's like. It's like you're not that interested into it. Even though you said you were, your body yeah. language tells me something different. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then, see, if you see that in somebody's body language, your point before about Starbucks, about actually seeing uh-huh. a person, that same thing is going on. And they might not even know it. You know, every now and then I get people go like, yeah, you know, I've been struggling with this for a while. Mm. I'm, really, I'm really conflicted about it. And they find themselves opening up because, yeah. you know, most of the time if you see conflict in somebody, most people say, ah, it'll be fine. Just keep working hard. It'll be right, fine. Right. It's all part of the journey. <laughs> right. Instead of actually being a great sounding board for somebody and, and helping them sound it out, consequently learning a lot about that person at the same time. It sounds like you're going through a lot right now. It sounds like you're having a hard time with this. It sounds yeah. like. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, and, uh, it, it's exactly right. And you start to become a tremendous sounding board for people. So what happens to that person when you respond in one of those three or four ways of it sounds like, feels like, uh, looks like, what does that person feel on the other side when you're showing that type of compassion or empathy? They feel connected with. Wow. They feel very connected with. They, they feel <clears throat> seen. You know, they feel like they're a person on the planet. They feel like suddenly they're not just another part of the thundering herd that nobody's paying any attention to. Yeah. They feel at least that. Um, last week we were doing a training with some, some, some pretty tough business people. And one of the guys in this exercise is saying like, I found myself talking about stuff that happened when I was seven years old. Wow. He said, I gotta tell you something, I feel transformed right now. And so we stopped the group at that point in time and we said, all right, so now based on Larry talking about that sort of a change, what kind of a guy is he to deal with? Mm. He's a pretty decent guy. Yeah. You now have caught a glimpse into him as more as a total human being, which means if he does something <laughs> that you perceive to be a negative move, he either did it accidentally or you misinterpreted it, which means it's okay to go back to him instead of you know, letting the rage build up in you because you misinterpreted something or did it by accident. He's a decent guy. If he, if he slighted you, he did it by accident. Right. You can go back to him and bring it up and say, hey, I got to tell you, I got a problem with this. Mm. He's probably going to open up because just based on this real, this three minute exercise, you found out about. He opened up then, so you probably, yeah. He's a decent human being. Wow. And every human being is going to hurt you, principally inadvertently. So you can go back to them and, and, and find out what's behind it and make them aware because they're going to want to know. Yeah. Every human being is going to hurt you? Everybody, one way or another, is going to do something accidentally or on purpose that's going to hurt your feeling. Mm-hmm. We're, going to, we're going to interpret it as negative the vast majority of the time. Yeah. When in fact it was probably a complete accident. There's a really good chance they got no idea they hurt your feelings. Right. You need to know which one it was. Mm-hmm. Did they do it on purpose? Do they know they did it? The numbers are that they did it by accident, and the other numbers are there's a really good chance they didn't know they did it. Right. You know, I went, I went to, uh, you know, a land, landmark forum a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. Yeah. 
talking about making amends with people, talking to people who have hurt yeah. you. And so one of the young ladies. Did you go uh, through the whole program? Yeah. One of the young ladies in it was like, you know, when I was seven, this, a girl who was my cousin, you know, you know they, they bullied me. You know, they said something that hurt me. I, you know, it's 30 years. I haven't let go. Wow. So we talked about it. They talked about it. And she said she went, she decided to go to the person and just, because to forgive, to forgive is to let go. You know, not forgiving is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies, yeah, right? Yeah. You've heard that. Yeah. So she goes to this girl and she says, I want you to know I forgot. The girl didn't even remember. She got no what? memory. She was just being a stupid kid at the yeah. time. She had, you know, We're they were stupid they, at seven, right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're joking around. And they're, and wow, so she held the, on to it for that long. 30 years, the other person doesn't even know it. So and by nature, we're joking around with somebody and we accidentally say something that wounded them. Mm -hmm. If they don't feel they can talk to us, they're gonna carry it for 30 years. Yeah. If I heard, if I heard somebody, I wanna know. Yeah. You know, I, cause I'm, I'm gonna be like, ah, I'm an idiot, you know? Yeah. I, had no, I had no idea I did that to you. Yeah. I had no idea. Was there anything from the emotional intelligence training at Landmark that added to your curriculum of negotiations that you didn't already know or use before? The, the, well, not because it's all inter interwoven. The biggest thing that jumped out at me is it, it occurred to me that somebody hurt somebody else without even knowing they did it. Like in, in, a, in, a, in a master class thing, you know, they did a great job. The master class people are phenomenal. Yeah. So we're wandering to the very tail end of it. And they got me talking about this guy that bullied me when I was a kid. You, yeah, yeah. you talking about, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, had, I, had, I had literally never told anybody about this. <clears throat> wow. So, you know, it's, and it happened when I was a little kid. Yeah. I literally had never told anybody about it. Not even through Landmark or anything else? Nothing. Wow. And they get it out of me in master class. They, they catch me off guard over it, you know, and it's to, to, to this day, this is one of the reasons why I hate bullies. You know, I want to become an FBI agent because, you know, we, we want to go after the bad guys because the bad guys are bullies. And there's nothing I like better than getting a bully that's victimizing somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think it was instilled in me in what happened when I was, when I was a kid. But then I started comparing that to this this interaction that I heard at Landmark where somebody bullied somebody else and they didn't even know they did it. Mm. And then I began thinking about like, how many people have I hurt and I didn't even know? Right. Like if they would have come up to me today and said, you heard you know, I've carried this for 40 years and I have to have done that to somebody. Right. Have to have I done that to somebody. Have. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, the, this, this forgiveness thing is a two way street and, all, and also being, being, you know, who, who do I need to go back to that I could think of? Mm. That I and, and say, look, look, uh, since I know that inadvertently I'm a jerk, <laughs> then I, what did I do? Right. I'm sure I did something. I had to have done something. Then it's an, it's an interesting dilemma, all, all sort of part of, you know, being a better person anyway, which yeah. I know is what, what you're dedicated to. It's almost, it seems like it's really hard, especially if you're a public figure that has an audience that you're going to say something or do something that's going to offend or hurt someone. Right. At all the times. Yeah. It's like you're always going to be offending someone if you have a voice. If you're right. sharing something, your, your point of view. Right. Your point of view is going to reach a certain audience's point of view, but not the rest of the world's point of view. So it's like you're always hurting people, aren't you? Yeah. And at some level, you're like offending, hurting, or frustrating and people. And their hurt's going to be defensive in reaction. Yeah. Or they misinterpret, or you, you hit a button with them yeah. that you didn't even, you had, maybe you didn't hit the button, but you came close to a button that's been hurt before. <laughs> close. And, you know, and interestingly enough, we see this a lot with the procurement people that come to our training. I'm really careful to say, look, look, I know you guys fear procurement. And, and this is about dealing successfully with procurement. Mm -hmm. And we had one person in the training go, I work in procurement and you criticized, you said procurement people were bad. I said, not, as a matter of fact, that's not what I said. But I came so close to your hot button that it hit it anyway. Yeah. And I spent some time with this woman and she was afraid that that was what I meant. And, but di didn't know how to approach me. Yeah. And when it came up subsequently, I said, no, as a matter of fact, procurement has one of the most difficult jobs on the planet. 
you guys are both, you spend your days either herding cats or getting chased by villagers with pitchforks. Right. You know, it's one or the other. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, yeah, it's really tough. I was just afraid that that's what you meant. Mm. It was that amygdala that we were talking about before, the 75% negative. Yeah. We're all equipped with that. And when someone even comes close to a criticism, then we're afraid that that's what they mean and they're hurt. How do you take criticism? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really been good at it until, I wouldn't say I've mastered it. I think I've gotten better. Uh, over the last six years, I started to really like say, okay, let me not react to this criticism. Like they probably have some good intention they're trying to tell me and maybe there's some truth there. So let me start to listen to the feedback or the criticism and say, okay, how can I be better? Is there any truth in there that really resonates or are they coming from a place of anger of their own thing? Criticism is mostly fear driven. By so, the person criticizing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, and it, you, you criticize that at a point of fact, you've been hurt, you've been disappointed, you've been frustrated. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, never take advice from anybody you wouldn't trade places with. Criticism is a form of advice, but you're afraid to tell people how to do stuff. So you just criticize what they do. Mm -hmm. Some people, and then they get, it becomes an addiction for some people. Criticism is not a great behavior. I, I know you've heard the phrase, nobody's doing better than you will ever criticize you. Right. They'll mentor you. Right. So... First of all, how do I take criticism? It, I got to take a step back and understand if somebody's coming at me with just a criticism, even if they ask permission to criticize, they got some, they got struggles that are worse than mine. Right. If they, and if they ask you to give you criticism, I'm, I be, you know, they are an open wound at that point. Yeah, in yeah, time. yeah, yeah. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say, yeah, sure, go ahead. Right. I'm, I'm going to, they've already told me they're probably coming from a difficult place. Gotcha, gotcha. So what I'm going to try to do is just kind of take it easy on them mm -hmm. and understand where they're coming from. Um, a blog I'm a big fan of, Eric Barker writes this great blog, okay. Barking Up the Wrong yeah, Tree. Yeah, that's great. Eric told me one time, for every, every hater, there's going to be 10 people that are on your side. Mm -hmm. So when a critic comes up to me, I see that as... There are 10 people, you're indicating to me that I'm successful with nine other people and I'm not gonna get down on this person yeah. because it's very easy to get down on them because unfortunately they're coming from a negative place. Yeah. What's a word you'd never say in a negotiation or the worst thing to say? Um, Business deals or personal relationships or? Uh, de uh, depends upon what's coming out, uh, whose mouth it's coming out of. Like do you ever say no or do you ever say? You, you know, I might need to say no. I, I'll probably, I like to let no out a little at a time. Which is actually how am I supposed to do that? Is the first way that I say no. That's no without saying no. Right. That's that's saying no to what's on the table, but not no to you. Let's figure if we can work this out. There may come a point in time when I when I say no, said and done. Um, but I'm, I'm going to need to explore every option there. I mean, I don't saying uh, hearing yes is a bad thing to hear. So don't say yes. Yeah, yes in and of themselves. I, I would much rather say, you know, okay, I'll do it. I'd, I'd lo I love to say you win. Because when you win, you're going to perform. Hmm. Yes is nothing without how. I need you to perform at a top level. Hmm. You perform at a higher level when you feel like you win. If I, if I hear, if you look at me and we make a deal and you say, okay, well, that's a resigned okay, and we're going to run into trouble when we go to implement because the, the minute anything mm. bad could happen by you by your inaction you know there's a phrase never be mean to someone who could hurt you by doing nothing mm. which nearly everybody can hurt you by doing nothing right um so saying okay i'll do it right or yes you win or you win right right I, yes. I, I want you to feel like you won you win so you got the better end of the deal yeah because are are you are you going to hold to the deal if you got the best end of the deal? Right, of course, you love it. you can brag yeah. about. Awesome, it. yeah, I got the better end, huh? Right. So you win. Okay, I'll do it. You win. You can do both of them together. Um, if I say it, that's good because you won. If you say it, it's bad to me because you feel beat. Mm. I don't want you to. I don't want you to feel beaten. Right, right, right. Which is one of the real big problems with negotiation because since since I've been getting helping people get better at it, like 
I get more stories. The guy says, let me tell you about this deal. I had them over a barrel. There was nowhere for them to go. You know, for all intents and purposes, I took them hostage. Well, I, I guarantee you that the person they beat um, was as passive aggressive as possible on the implementation of that deal. Mm, they didn't feel they good about it. Money on the table. They didn't feel good about it. Right. Huh. Right. So always make the other person feel like they got the better end of the deal. Right. Right. They won. And yeah, they won. And, and it was their idea. It was their idea. I like your idea. I'll do it. Something like that. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean that that that's really good, and so that's why the one usually the one word answers of yes and no, those are also frequently misunderstood. Mm. You know, there's three kinds of yeses: there's commitment, confirmation, counterfeit. Huh. And most people are used to getting lured into a trap with yes. You know, would you like to make more money? Isn't it true this is the off season? You know, whatever setup, <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> would you like? Okay, yeah. Um, you know what's leading someplace. Yes. One of my uh, one of my students is on a honeymoon, and he's wanting to get um, uh, an upgrade on his bungalow. And it's the off season in this in this resort. Now, what they typically do is they cut prices on on their basic rooms, but, but they not don't the honeymoon cut, suites. But not the honeymoon right. suites. And he, but he knows they're all vacant. Now, what he he doesn't want to cut price on a regular room. He wants a honeymoon suite, and he starts out the conversation with like, you know, isn't it true this is the off season? And the general manager knows there's a trap there. So what's know, he say? And, and so the guy starts going sideways on him immediately. Oh, really? He didn't say yes. Right. He didn't want to say yes because he knows that yes is commitment and yes is probably a trap. And he he knows I don't know where you're going with this, but you're going someplace. That's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> and then what happened? Well, then, and so then uh, my student realized that you know he fell into this this yes trap thing. Mm. So he had to kind of he had to kind of get back out of it. And they started talking, and instead of trying to get yeses and nos on him, he started describing the situation. It started showing him a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm sure you know a lot of guys on like me come in. We want a room. We don't want to pay anything for it. You get so many tourists that are in here in the off season, and they're cheap. That's why they're here in the off season anyway, because they're cheap to start with, and they don't right. want to pay anything for for anything anyway. And now the the managers appreciate where the guy's coming from. Uh, so he ends so up leading getting, with the negative, right? He ends up, he ends up getting the upgrade. Really? Yeah. It's free because he built a relationship and yeah, the guy the guy the guy's got an empty room. Yeah. Never be meeting somebody who could hurt you by doing nothing. Not giving you the the empty room is doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you want this guy to give you a favor. And he doesn't own the hotel, and those rooms are normally vacant anyway. So his owner, whoever owns the hotel, they're not mad at him because those rooms are empty. They expected them to be empty. Yeah. So he's got options. You know, ultimately, you want to make the pitch like, you know, you give me that upgrade, I'm going to be a fan for life. I'm going to tell everybody how well I was treated. I'm going to come back and I'm going tell all my friends about this. Something I've done for like the last 10 years, a friend of mine told me this line that he's like, you know, if you ever want an upgrade, if you ever want like something better in the deal, use this line. And I swear I've been using it. Maybe it's been wrong, but I'd love your opinion. All right. I say, what's the chance you can help me with this? All right, so that's a, that's a what question to start what's with. What's the it's chance? Two things about that that yeah. I like. Um, first of all, it's a what question. Yeah. And secondly. Um, what's the chance you can upgrade me? You're uh, elevating the person when you ask it for help. So you're giving them power, right? Right. The opportunity to have power. Right. Yeah, so there's. And and I don't know that I'd change that sentence at all. I might say in advance, like, look, this is really going to seem greedy of me. Mm. You know, because so you can't you can't leaving with the negative. Leading leading with the negative. Wow. If you if you try to call out a negative that's not there, you won't plant it. If you try to deny a negative that's not there, you plant that baby. And that's why you have to know the difference between a denial and a straight observation. And those, that's a subtle difference. Because you're, you're probably going to want to say, before you ask a guy for a discount, you're probably going to say, this guy's going to think I'm cheap and I'm greedy. I don't want him to think that. Mm-hmm. So if you mention it at all, you've got instinct to say, look, like, I, don't wanna, I, don't want, I, want you, I don't want you to think I'm cheap and greedy here. That's a denial. That plants mm-hmm. it. So uh, I bet you might think that I'm being a little greedy. I'm sure it's, I'm sure I'm sure it's, it's coming across. Greedy. I'm coming, that I'm, that yeah. I'm being greedy, but what's the chance you can help, you can upgrade me? Yeah. 
Yeah. You can support me in getting upgraded. And, and so if you're not, if asking for an upgrade as a human being, the, the guy's going, no, that's not gritty. You want, them, you want them thinking no. You want them saying no. Mm. No is a great answer because when somebody says no, they def- have just protected and defended themselves. Like it's ridiculous. You will be stunned at what people are willing to say no to. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely stunned. I'm, I'm, I'm coaching a guy <laughs> who's working on a new position with the city of Beverly Hills. And they, they're they constructing, since it's a new position, he sees his job description that he wants to take, but it's problematic the way they put it together. Yeah. And he says, how do I negotiate with these guys? Because this job description is not going to make it work. And I said, look at, look, at, look at him across the table and say, do you want me to fail? And their answer is no. And I said, well, look at how this is set up. I, you know, I'd love to have this job. But he's, instead of saying, he wants us to down with him and say, hey, look, this is never going to work the way you guys designed this. Right. You can't say that, though. You can't say that. Because so, then they're coming from defense mode or something. Or, right, right, uh, right. Now their ego's in a way. But you say, no. because when you say, you, do you want me to fail? I mean, that, that's, that's, that no, gives them again to, to help you. Yeah, they say no. They protect themselves. You then come to the other guy's rescue. I mean, you're, you're punching a lot of really powerful emotional triggers there when you say to somebody, do you want me to fail? Hmm. And, and one way or the other, I mean, we try to sit down and think of the most ridiculous question that they would never say yes to. Like if, if, if at the end of a negotiation, uh, if I can't, if my one of my last things I'm always going to say is like, if you can't budge at all, I'll say, "All right, well, look, uh, it seems like you're powerless here." Oh, because nobody hurts. wants to say yes to oh. that. <laughs> wow, seems like there's nothing you can do. It seems like wow. you're completely powerless here, and they'll put you on hold. They'll find a way to help. You. <laughs> so it seems like you're powerless. You can't help me. It sounds like you're powerless here. Right. Nobody ever wants to say yes to that. Wow. Yeah. That is powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you use that a lot when you're at the end of the any phone deal bill or anything or something? You at know? the end of any deal, if we haven't come to an agreement that, that I'm happy with, that'll be the last thing. I'll say it seems like there's nothing I could say. And it seems like you're powerless. It seems like nothing that you could say to them to right. get what you need. Right. Or for them to move. Right. deal points and it seems like you're powerless right. they're powerless right holy cow that's, yeah. that's powerful insight so yeah we, we a lot of people have cut deals by they thought it was completely in the tank and they're actually just trying to end positively it's really it's critical to end positively mm. so give me one little extra thing then if you know they want to end positively not like yeah I'm powerless here so let's do the deal yeah okay yeah. I'll throw in this or I'll give you this or yeah like I make it, I make it a regular part. Uh, like my credit cards, almost all of them got fees, mm-hmm. and I call every year, ask them to waive the fee, yeah. and and they almost always do until the guy says, "Well, we waived the fee on you the last five years in a row." <laughs> so it sounds like you're powerless here. And I, I'll say, "Yeah, I'll say that. I'll say it sounds like you're absolutely powerless here. It sounds like you're nothing, nothing you could do," and they'll put me on hold. Let's see, let me see what I could do. <laughs> They'll come back and do it because nobody wants to be powerless. Oh, wow. That's great. Someone taught me this like 12 years ago. Um, And he said, use this. Say, what are the chances that you can do this? What are the chances you can get me an upgrade? What are the chances you'd be able to do this? Yeah. After you created the rapport and the connection and all those things, what's the chance? And that has worked really well for me. And I'm wondering why do you think using that has also worked? Okay, so I'm, and I'm glad you brought that up because you asked me about questions before. Mm-hmm. If you're going to ask a question, they should only start with either the words how or what. Mm. Because they feel very deferential to the other side. People loved to be asked what somebody should do or how somebody should do something. It's extremely appealing to the other side. There's great power in deference. Mm. It feels deferential. So it's a lot more impactful than just saying it's an open-ended question. The who, what, when, where, why, and how should really just be narrowed down to what and how. Okay. Now, how is primarily but not exclusively 
to map implementation. How am I supposed to do that? Is actually, how am I supposed to implement that? Mm-hmm. What, you know, how, how do we get this done? It's implementation. What, primarily but not exclusively, to uncover obstacles? Mm-hmm. What stands in the way? Mm-hmm. What are the chances? So when you put it like that, you got a what question. It feels deferential. It's open-ended. It triggers deep thinking. Danny Kahneman talks about deep, slow thinking. Your demeanor is very genuine and curious and connective. You want to talk with people. And then what are the chances triggers people to immediately begin to assess where the obstacles in the environment are. Mm -hmm. And they're really going to probably, if you look back at all your answers, because what are the chances, most of the time, if I were to technically answer that question, I would say the answer would be 50%, 75%. Right, right. In point of fact, people probably say like, well, here's what we got to overcome. Here's what we got to do. Here's what that would look like. They would be answering you in regards to the things to be overcome in order to make it happen. And then you can negotiate more. And And then they would think about chances or how hard each of those obstacles would be to overcome. So those are the things I love about that question. That's interesting. When you were practicing, again, you're practicing all all the time. I feel like this is something I've been doing as just a game in my life. Just like a fun challenge. Can I get this from this person? Can I do this? Can I get an upgrade? It's just like a fun thing that I've been doing for a while. But when I started reading your book and having you on, I was like, okay, I need to do this even more. The question I'm curious about is with every interaction, is there always something we can get? Even if they say no, like for example, if they say, no, we can't upgrade you. I try to say, well, can I have a free mint? (laughs) And if they say, oh, we don't have any mints. Then I say, can I get a fist bump? You know, can I get a, a smile? I'm always trying to like get a something, even if it's a little something. What's your thoughts on that? Like, even if they say no, even if they say no to everything that you want, but can you smile for me? Can you give me a bottle of water? Can you give me something? You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I I love it. There's energy. There's measurable energy. So, it's always if you're a complete mercenary, uh huh, it's to your advantage to be increasing your positive karma. Right. That's going to constantly increase your chances of success. (laughs) Right. And the more karma you leave around you, you know, whether it's real or whether, you know, who knows what it is, Mm -hmm. but you're going to, you're going to increase your chances of success. Yes. And so, or, you know, you increase the chance of success of the guy behind you and the guy behind you ends up sitting next to you on a plane Mm -hmm. or, you know, whoever's in line alongside you as you're increasing that karma is probably there because, yeah, if it's on the airplane, they're going to be on, on a plane next yeah, to you. It might be yeah. the dude next to you. You know, they might be the guy who either rubs the flight attendant the wrong way or he makes her feel good. And consequently, when she walks up to you, she has a different, I mean, there's, you know, the sort of the domino effect. Mm-hmm. The domino effect's always there. So I love that. I love that approach. Yeah. Yeah. And then on um, point of fact, it, you're doing it in a positive fashion, which keeps you smarter. Mm-hmm. So you're probably more prepared for your next interaction. Right. And there's nothing that fuels our momentum like success. Yes. So if all you got on this dude was a fist bump, right. you're walking forward with a success. Something, yeah. It's something, yeah. okay. Good to know. Um, can you share your, for you, your greatest negotiation, both when you were working FBI, it could be not in a hostage situation, but just the greatest negotiation you had during your time there, and also your greatest negotiation in life outside of that. This could be something small, this could have been for like the biggest deal ever, this could have been an intimate relationship, this could have been a buying a car, uh, this could be you know rescuing a hostage, but I'm curious if you can give one example, personal life and professional life. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there, there was there were some different victories in hostage negotiation. Um, after uh, a really bad debacle, uh, second case I worked in the Philippines, second major case, the Burnham Sabrell case, two or three hostages uh, would died, died in friendly fire at the end. That whole case, 13 months from beginning to end, a lot of people died. 
It was a train wreck. It was, it was ugly from start to finish. An, uh, an American citizen was executed early on. I mean, everything about that was ugly. Everything. And um, we had... Somebody got proof of life in the middle of that case, and I don't know who it was or how they got it. And all we, we find out one of our hostages on the phone. Hostages only ever on the phone for proof of life, and he ain't on the phone with us. And we're thinking, like, who the heck is out there? Is there a competing bidder for the mm, hostages? Like, mm. it was insane. So I struggled that, that for a long time. Finally got the revelation of how it was done, which was, in my view, somebody on the other side and an, another player asked a how question. So that was when we first got onto how questions. Drug dealer in Pittsburgh. Really? Drug dealer on drug dealer kidnapping. They Drug dealer... Goes to the FBI, because who do you go to when somebody important you get kidnapped? The FBI, no matter who you are, even if you're a drug dealer. His girlfriend gets grabbed by another drug dealer. Huh. Hostage negotiators are riding around with this guy. On his own, he says to the other bad guy, hey, dog. It's my favorite phrase of all time. Hey, dog. How do I know she's alive? How question. Everything changes in that moment. Who really had the upper hand shifted from the guy with the, quote, leverage who had the hostage Total shift in upper hand when he asked that how question. So I'm like, this is it. This is it. This is it. We got to change. Start doing how questions. We got to do how questions. But what if someone, the uh, uh, the person who has the hostage is like, well, you have to trust me or this person's going to die. You know, you just have to believe, you know. That's a possibility. Right. And then what would the follow-up how question be if someone's being unreasonable and not Giving you a little bit. How are we supposed to pay if we don't know they're alive? Right. You know, we, we, got, we, got, we got a couple lined up for the bad scenario. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a possibility that they may still go because that's the way it is. Right. But you got to go that path to find out. First, yeah. You can't be afraid of going that path. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do the higher questions. And we do a shift we got another kidnapping in Ecuador. This guy named Pepe, who I'm still friends with. The kidnapper? Uh, the hostage. Oh, I was like, I got you. I was like, the kidnapper? I got some bizarre friends. I'm I got, sure you do. I got former prison gang members that are friends. I'm sure you do, yeah. But none of them were hostage takers. Okay, yeah. Um, so this was the hostage. Hostage. Pepe, still a friend, he and his family. So we asked a how question. Now, the, it's in Ecuador and the Gaula, which is the local police in Ecuador. They're like, we don't do it like that down here. Mm. We ask a different proof of life question. Pepe's wife afterwards says she knew there was tension between the FBI and the Gaula. And she knew it was there. But she appreciated the professionalism that nobody would argue in front of her. Well, they were arguing about this change I wanted them to make. So we're, do, we're doing a how question. And halfway through this thing. They start referring to Pepe as Don Pepe. And we're like, what? Don, that's a sign of respect. Mm. What in God's name is going on on the other side of the table? And about 28 days in, Don Pepe makes good as escape. He goes escapes. Out, goes out 2, two o'clock in the morning, driving a rainstorm, middle of the jungle, goes out a window. He's a jungle guy. He was a jungle guide he, ahead of time. In 28 days, he'd been there. He figured out where the nearest town was, how to get there. He knew if he goes out in the rain, all he needs is a 20-minute head start. They're not going to be able to track him. He's going to be able wow. to get to town. He's going to be able to get out of there. Interesting. 28 days in, I get a call from the same negotiator that had called me a year earlier and said, I got bad news. Martin Burnham is dead. This same guy happens to be in Ecuador on my behalf. And he says, hey, Pepe's out. He escaped. He hasn't got out of guerrilla territory yet. He's on a bus. We're going to meet him. Wow. And so I'm, this is all this how thing. So we never got proof of life. I can't wait to interview Pepe. He's actually a New York State resident. He's an American citizen, dual national. I'm sitting down with him in upstate New York, and I'm like, hey, you know, uh, we, never, we, never, we never got proof of life. We were asking this how question. And he said, you know, it was crazy. The whole time, they talked about taking me to town to put me on the phone. 
And, and they kept talking with me about that. And that was one of the major factors that he went from being a commodity, a piece of property that they were housing in a house waiting to be sold, to this forced interaction on the other side of the table where they had to talk to him regularly. Mm, kind of build a relationship with them. And he happened to be very good at relationship building. Wow. So we triggered the interaction and then he capitalized on it with his natural gut instincts. Wow. Creating the opportunity, they, they relaxed his security so much because they got to know him as a person. They were less worried about him running away. They got very relaxed around him. They, let, they gave him the run of the camp. He sees the opportunity, 2 a.m. rainstorm, he's gone. Wow. And that, to me, that was like great negotiation gives the opportunity for good things to happen. Mm -hmm. And you don't get so focused on your outcome that you wouldn't take something better. Mm. And just, just engage in a process and let great things happen. Wow. And he escaped, and that was not part of the game plan. And I realized if we got a great process... If good things are going to happen, you got to let them happen. Yes, that's powerful. And what about personal, personal life outside of the FBI? Best, most memorable negotiation. Again, it could be some big deal or something that was small but really meaningful to you. Wow. Uh, Director of Operations, Black Swan Group. Mm -hmm. uh, Chelsea. Loves working with us. And we initially brought her in as one of the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, the virtual assistants. Yes. You know, not an employee. And you get a virtual assistant because if they don't work out, you don't got to fire them. You say, hey, this person wasn't the right fit. We learned about fit. Chelsea's phenomenal. And just loves working with us. And uh, the, the most satisfying one was when we hired her. Um, the, the virtual company um, wanted to continue with us as a customer, and we were a good customer. Mm -hmm. And so they let, you know, the deal that you sign in advance is you if you hire an assistant, you got to pay them a penalty. you got to pay them like 30 or 50% of that yeah. year's salary or whatever, yeah. Right. Like, they waived that. We brought Chelsea on. We got, we got a waiver because we continue to do business with them, and we're a good customer, and we're not demanding jerks. No aggravation tax. Mm -hmm. But we took one of the top people. So that negotiation went well, and when we brought Chelsea on board... We gave her a substantial raise, and she she almost broke down in tears. Wow, that was cool. That's cool. And she's to this day like I joke around that she's like I'm a toddler, and she's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she's a minor. She keeps tracking me. Right, right. And if I'm not where I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm getting a buzzing on my phone. Yeah, that's great. Her husband plays a banjo, so her ringtone is a banjo. Wow, that's great. <laughs> In a world that has now shifted to what seems like might be a for a while half virtual, half in person, this kind of flexible style of communication, what have you noticed over the last couple of years about the challenges of virtual negotiations versus in person negotiations? See, that's another reason why I think this energy thing that you feel is real. Because, you know, people get on Zoom and they go like, ah, you know, I, I got to see them. I got to see them. I got to be in person. Like, you got almost all the same data visually that you mm -hmm. had before. Yes. Like, if you and I are meeting in person and we're at a table, I don't see you from the waist down. Right. If we're on Zoom, I don't see you from the waist down. The amount of visual data is all there. And everybody feels more uncomfortable more, on Zoom. And more, more uncomfortable? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Everybody complains about the comfort feeling on Zoom. And they attribute it to the visual data, and the visual data hasn't changed. And it's my belief mm. that there is a feel, there's an actual feel that we get from people when we're in the room. And I, I think it's one more indicator of why, you know, this, uh, uh, whether you call them, uh, you know, auras or, you know, the energy mm -hmm. that you exude is an actual thing. And we just don't have the ability to measure it yet. Yes. I mean, like if we were all deaf, sound would seem mystical, right? Right. So I think I think that's what we've learned mm -hmm. in terms of human communication. And then I think the the hybrid model is actually better for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think it's created a better work environment. I think we we have learned that we can be more effective at home, and we need to get out of our houses. Right. 
and we need to be in person. You need both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so how do we blend the two so that not only you're happier and more productive, and you're happier because you're more productive. Mm-hmm. And then and then you find the right job, and your employer's happier with you because you're doing a better job and you're happier. Yeah. So I, I think uh, energy is real. In-person energy is real. I love the evolution of how we're creating a better work environment. Yeah. I don't think you have to have an office, but I think we need to be in person frequently just to feel... There's something about matching of the energies that makes us all better. Mm. That's cool. Have you ever gone up against, not like gone up against, but worked with another master negotiator? In Everybody deals? on my team. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but maybe a complete stranger that you're like, oh, this person, oh, they know what they're doing. Like they're, they're another level of, they're using your strategies or they have their own that are really effective. And is it harder to negotiate with someone who is actually really powerful communicator, confident, using great negotiation strategies, not manipulative? Or is it easier because you kind of both speak the same language? It's, uh, well, it, it really depends upon whether or not they're trying to be collaborative. Yeah. And so it's easier. Uh, a, a black swan trained negotiator is trying to be collaborative. That's a great negotiation. I mean, and, and we're, we're engaged in it all the time. Right. Like our, our clients... We're making them better negotiators. Like we're always trying to scare out a better deal. Mm. We're always trying to figure out what's better for them, what's better for us. Sure. Um, and so uh, welcome it. It's really what the other person's trying to do. And there, we've run across some old style people. You know, you're here in Los Angeles. Entertainment industry oh, yeah. is famous for being purely exploitive. Yes. So you could have a great resume in the entertainment industry be a really offensive human being. Mm-hmm. Now, because of your resume, your employer might think they're hiring a great person. Mm-hmm. When in fact, you're running around offending people regularly right. and, and had a negotiation like this where it started going off the rails early. And I looked this person up and they had an extensive entertainment industry background. And I thought, all right, here's the problem. Right. <laughs> Their resume looks great, mm-hmm. but it's from an industry where if you cannot get every get all the chips, then you don't want to do that deal. Mm-hmm. And and then I, uh, which I also think, the top level of the entertainment industry, you know, these guys got, and gals get together at a social function, and they say, "Look, stop messing around. What do you need? How do we make this deal right, so we're both right, better?" Right, right, right. But they're very quiet about that. Yes. Because they don't want to be seen as pushovers. Right. Because, well, it takes a month or two to negotiate, then they're back during, like, what do we need to do? Let's figure this out. Yeah. 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 So, we, you know, we see, when I see those types adopting our skills, if somebody's using Black Swan against me, but I'll figure that out really fast. Really? <laughs> and, I'm, you know, it's not a sin to not get the deal. It's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal. Because mm, you're wasting time. You're wasting time. It's also a sin to take a long time to get a bad deal. Yeah. So if I know the deal is going to be a bad deal, then we quit and we move on. What do you do when something you feel like is dragging off? You're going back and forth, back and forth, and it's been weeks, a month. We don't go back and forth. Really? No. Look, there's a good reason it's going back and forth. We're going to figure that out, and we're going to make a decision, and we're going to move on. Mm. And we started... You know, our, our internal terminology, which I borrowed from a guy, Joe Polish, Genius yeah. Network, he calls them halves and elves. Easy, lucrative, and fun, hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. What some people would call a PETA, pain in the neck. PETA does not obviously finish with an N. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's got their term for that person. So I, t- I tell my team, who negotiates on my behalf all the time, look, let's walk away from the halves sooner rather than later. Let's develop a profile of what a half says mm. so we can figure them out earlier. Now, in the meantime, let's pull our own data. How long does it take to make a deal with a good customer? How long does it take to make a deal with an annoying customer? And we found out two things. Number one, it can take five times as long to make the deal with an annoying customer. Wow. 
So now we're working at 20% of our pay. Mm -hmm. We just took an 80% pay cut. Interesting. And the annoying comp customers are not repeats. Right. They're, they're takers. Yeah. And if, if they're annoying for us, we're probably annoying for them. Mm -hmm. So here's the, here's the pro proposition. Do you want repeat customers that pay you full value? Or do you want one-offs that want an 80% discount and you're never going to see them again? Mm -hmm. So as soon as you drop the one-offs, then the repeaters accelerate. So it's, it's, how do you put yourself in a, in a position where your business accelerates? Right. You let go of those types of people. So it's, you let go of the friction. It's learning to profile and learning to understand what are the cues yep. of those types of individuals. Yeah. Yeah. We did the same thing in hostage negotiation. Mm -hmm. They realized that there were some bad guys that were not going to come out. Suicide by cop. And once we recognized suicide by cop, which is, you know, the, the harsh nature of the reality is... If the guy went there to die and he has hostages, what we had to accept was that he's going to kill hostages until we kill him. Mm. And it was always a him. Wow. And so then, if this is going to be the case, are there telltale signs at the beginning? And my old boss, Gary Nessner, came up with a block of instruction called high-risk indicators. What are the indicators of high risk? What are you going to see in the first hour? And so I went back to my team and I, well, we're going to do high risk indicators for bad customers. Mm, that's good. What are they going to say in the first hour? Interesting. And then let's, and then let's, before we know for sure, let's make a list of the things that they say that we suspect. And then let's just track how long it took to make the deal and whether or not they made another deal. And you will be shocked. It doesn't matter who you are. Wow. The behavior is going to be repeated in your world over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And you are going to be able to spot them in the first 20 minutes. <laughs> if I look back at all the relationships, intimate relationships that didn't work, I could go back and spot the first, you know, interaction, the second one, and, and realize, well, that was all because of me. I didn't spot it cor correctly, and I kept repeating <laughs> the wrong relationships, so... Um, but that's good. It's having those indicators, tracking it, and, and then adjusting moving forward when you have a new potential customer, potential girlfriend, whatever it might be, <laughs> having that indicator. I give you one of the big ones in business of somebody uh -huh. who's going to be a problem. Yes. I've got a great opportunity for you. That's a bad ind indicator. That's a bad indicator. Mm. And what that means is, this is a great opportunity for me if you do all the work. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are seduced by the, the enormity of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of money there. I got a bunch of billionaires in a room. This is a great opportunity for you. No, it's not. No, you're doing all the work. <clears throat> yeah. You want to put me in front of those billionaires because they're going to make you look good. And so then my question will be back to you like, all right, so. As it's played out in the past. Who that looks like me did you put in this position and how did it work out for them? Mm -hmm. Because now that's implementation. Like, all right, so you got me worried by offering me this great opportunity. I suspect it means if I do all the work, something will come of this. Yeah. So maybe... What's that work look like? Right. Have you done this in the past? Mm -hmm. How did it work out? Sure. I'm asking how questions. Because mm -hmm. I'm suspicious, but I got to worry about how's this going to go. Yeah. So that, that's that been a real consistent thing across the board. It's a big indicator. Yeah. It's powerful stuff, Chris. Listen, uh, I got a great opportunity for you. <laughs> you know what? If you would just go to Dubai <laughs> and move your whole operation to uh -huh. Dubai yeah. and set up there... Like, I think Dubai is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be sitting there like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Do you have any idea the time zone I know. and how many people I have? Yeah. But I actually, when we were talking earlier, I asked you about setting up shop in other countries. Mm -hmm. And your immediate reaction was how hard that was going to be. Yes. Because in throwing it out there, I want to get a feel for 
is this a layup for you? Is mm-hmm. this a slam dunk? Mm-hmm. Am I? Do I think it's a slam dunk and you think it's a three-point shot? Right. Or it's a half-court shot? Yeah. Now I'm teasing this out. Like I, mm-hmm. There are things like that that could be good opportunities for some people. But is your team set up and ready to move for it? Right, right. That's really where that all that comes in. So if somebody has a great opportunity, I got to know what the journey looks like. My team is set up or mm-hmm. it's not. Right. But I can't jump at that opportunity. And there are a number of places out there that are glittering jewels in the distance, mm-hmm. like Dubai, which I'm thinking seriously about mm. setting up shop there. Really? But it doesn't work for everybody. Right. Right. So I got I the, some somebody saying to me Dubai is an opportunity that ain't good enough. Right, I've been there twice. It's it's actually pretty fascinating what they built. I mean, it's pretty impressive. But again, you're on the other side of the world, you know. And if you do a lot of business in the U.S. and it's just a different, you got to see if that that could be a bigger benefit over there. What's the journey to the opportunity, yeah. and what are the obstacles in route? Absolutely. And very few people think about that because. A great idea looks like a great opportunity and they don't have an appreciation for the landscape on the way. What's a role-playing exercise that anyone could do with a friend um, that would make them a better negotiator? In Try general. to get whoever you're talking to to say the magic two words, that's right. Which means you gotta summarize where they're coming from. If you... Hmm. In, in any given interaction, if you got a point you want to make, <laughs> yeah. before you make it, your trigger, you're not allowed to make your point. So give me an example. Um, and you want the other person you're role playing with to say, that's right. Okay, so you were telling me about critics. Yeah. You're a high profile guy. You're about helping other people, which means you get criticized a lot. That's right. <laughs> and when you get criticized, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't say you're empathic, although you are. Mm-hmm. I would say you're probably more compassionate. Those are two different things. Mm. Empathy is, you have to have empathy to be compassionate. But empathy is not compassion. Compassion is the next step. Empathy is a compassionate thing to do, genuinely understanding somebody. But there's a real fine line there that distinct things. And I think you have a tremendous amount of compassion for people. So you know that when someone criticizes you, they're attacking you. Mm. But you also know that they've been hurt and they're struggling. So you want to know how to respond to them and have them better as a result of the interaction instead of coming back and making it feel worse, and you struggle with that because you're under attack, mm-hmm. and you try, not to, you try not to fire back at them. Right, yeah, that's right. They, <laughs> so you wanna have a conversation with someone. If you could summarize their point of view first. Uh-huh. Summarize the other person's, when, when you summarize the other, what the other person's struggling with. In, in any type of deal making. In any type of a deal. A business deal, a relationship, a buying coffee, upgrading, whatever it is. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Then after that, you can make your point. Interesting. Make your point or make your proposal or. or yeah, or whatever. So if you're trying, you're to, get point, you're a, if you're trying to get an upgrade on an airport, uh, you know, on a plane or at a hotel. Right. Or trying to get a super size made for free. Right. You're trying to get some type of upgrade for free. Right. Would you do the same thing? Would you say, I know you're going through, and it seems like it's been a long day for you. Well, you can look at them and tell whether it's gonna be a long day. So right off the bat, you say, long day? Right. And then as, as soon as you get ready to make your ask, what's their initial instinctive response, their knee-jerk reaction, what's that gonna be? Bef- when I make an ask? Once you've made your ask, uh-huh. what's their, pr- of, of somebody's trying to get something for free, Yeah. What's a typical knee-jerk reaction? Oh, this person's just trying to get something for free from me? Right. Yeah. Uh, so... And everyone does this, or everyone... There you, know, you go. Everyone's doing this. Yeah, so you walk up and you go like, hey, look, man, I know I, I'm going to seem like just another jerk who's trying to get something for free. Mm. Somebody who treats you like you're their servant. Oh, man. 
somebody who doesn't care about you could care less whether you live or that. They only care that you're, long, you're alive long enough to make my coffee. Because that's what the other guy's thinking. Mm. How do you articulate what they're thinking, especially the negative stuff about you? When you say that, they're going to be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but what you did was you just woke them up. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, woke, you snapped them out of the negative loop that's in their head because the last guy come in and said, yeah, I want to and I want it now. And I hate waiting in line to start. <laughs> do you do this all the time, all day long? Are you constantly well, in the game of negotiation with people? It's, uh, it's that, you know, that I brush my teeth today mm-hmm. just because I brushed them yesterday. You know, I, 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 de- I genuinely, I got to keep my skills up because yeah, it's either stay even, decline, or get better. <clears throat> I want to keep my skills up. The mercenary in me does it because I got to keep my skills up. The missionary in me does it because I actually care about people. Yeah. I just assume that you had a good day. Yeah, yeah. You know, that you didn't, that my interaction with you didn't leave you worse. Mm-hmm. That my interaction with you left you better. Everybody we encounter should be left better by the interaction. How important is the intention before you walk up to the coffee shop, before you go to the hotel? before you get on the phone with the, the other business owner to make a deal, before you have a conversation with your partner about where you're going to dinner, do you set an intention first? Like walking into the hotel, you're like, this is what I'm going to say. This is the result that I want to get out of this. This is the, the way I want to leave people feeling. The intention, do you, do you yeah, the intention, the intention is, you know, I, 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 want to, I want you to have fun with the interaction. Mm. The other person. Yeah. I want you to have fun. If, I, if, I, if I'm playful, if I'm intending for you to have fun, you know, I'm in a department store. Yeah. I'm joking around with the guy behind the counter. And I go, I go, tell you what, you know what? How about if you give me the employee discount? Right. Give me the employee discount. I'll say it like that. Give yeah. me the employee discount. And the guy in the store says, if I give you the employee discount, I'm going to have to pay for it myself. Really? And I go, I'll pay you back. <laughs> I said it just like that. He went and he started walking around asking people how he could key, key it in and get me the same discount without having to pay it himself. He walked around the store for 10 minutes. Really? I, I, and I, and I, saw, I saw him walk up to a manager. I the manager shaking his head. Yeah, he's going to someone else. Isn't and then on his way back, another employee walked up to him on the side, whispered in his ear, and he went, okay, and he walked up and I get 30% off. Wow. <laughs> So, but you didn't pay him back. It was just like a playful. I just, you know, yeah. I just, I'm just, I just was being playful about it. Just wow. being silly about it. And what's the best way to get an upgrade at a hotel for you? All right. So, uh, slightly different take on the approach. Yes. My son does this all the time. My son, Brandon, runs my business. He's our best negotiator. He prides himself when we all come into a hotel. He's got to be in a better room than me. <laughs> And I'm the boss. That's hilarious. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm paying the bills. Yeah, of course. He got an upgrade in a hotel one, one time that I couldn't even get on the floor. <laughs> you mean a special key? Yeah. Key code? Yeah. Me, me and the other guys were going, hey, we'll come up to your room. He goes, no, no, I got, he goes, I got to come get you. Oh, I, wow. no, I said, no, we'll just come knock on your door. He goes, no, you can't even get on the floor I'm on. He paid less for his room than I paid for mine. Wow. And I'm, I'm the boss. Wow. But he'll walk up to somebody and say, I'm getting ready to make your day, your day the most difficult day you ever worked here. <laughs> and he says, because somebody works behind a counter at a hotel, I mean, God knows what they've seen. Oh, you know, have horrible. you got a head in the bag? Do you want to, are you going to have ritual sacrifice in a room? Right. You know, what have you done? You've done, because in a hotel, they've seen every, every kind of sort of crazy thing you could imagine. Mm-hmm. And they just go, oh, God. What is it? And he goes, I'm just going to be another self-centered person looking for a free upgrade. And they're like, oh, my God. That's it? That's it? That's it? Oh, yeah. And they're, they're, they're immediately through the roof. And I start checking it in and this and this. Hey, you know what? Uh, yeah, I tell you what. Let me, let me give you this room. It's on, it's on the exclusive floor. Mm. It's in a presidential suite. President ain't coming, so I'm going to give you the president. <laughs> uh, right, right, right. I know the president ain't coming tonight. We're holding the suite for him just in case. You can have it. He's not going to be here. Wow. I remember from our interview the last time, I think if my memory is right, you would say one of the strategies is leading with like being challenging in a certain way or I'm, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be demanding a lot. 
Isn't that something that you talk? Well, to, to a little bit, yeah. Something you know, that way, right? I, I'm gonna if 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 I know you're gonna react negatively yeah. to my ask, I will give you a preview that makes it worse look worse than what than, it is. than what it's gonna be. Yeah. So what do you call that? That uh, framework. For lack of a better term, it's emotional anchor emotional anchoring. Emotional anchoring. You know, we we don't do price anchoring. Uh huh. You know, but we'll do emotional anchoring if if. If you're not going to like what I have to say, I'm going to say, look, you're not going to like this. Right. That's what it is. And then I'm going to shut up because your amygdala is going to kick into gear and you're going to think that I'm going to insult you, your parentage, your family, your genealogy, your right. parents, everything. Because the amygdala is going to go into overdrive. Wow. So that whatever I ask for after that is going to be relief. And I'm doing that also because... I need to keep an eye on how you feel when we're done. Mm. Not as much how you feel at the start, but how you feel when we're done. So you want someone to be, it's okay if they start off in a lower energetic uh, or negative attitude. As long as when you finish, they feel like, okay, it got better over time. Yeah, you, 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 feel, you feel good at the end. The last impression is a lasting impression. Interesting. It, and that's unavoidable. Yeah. It's, a, it's what we refer to as a law of gravity. Huh. It doesn't, you know, we have gravity. We can't explain why gravity works, but you're still not going to step off the balcony because gravity's there. Right. The last impression is a lasting impression, mm. no matter what. Mm. So I need to, more than anything else, make sure that the last impression is positive or at least feels collaborative. Let's say you've... Um been in a negotiation with someone or you're a business partner with someone or you've been in a, a long negotiation for six months with someone, either one. Right. You've been a business partner working together for a year or two or you've been trying to find a deal with someone else for a year or two. Right. And both, it's taking too long. Both options are taking too long right. that haven't, you haven't been getting the results you want and you feel like you've been taken advantage of a little bit. Let's just say that. How do you, and it's going, it started off good and it's going the opposite way. Right. It's getting worse and worse. How do you finalize it so that it goes back to a high or a higher mark, leaving you feeling better and leaving the other person feeling better? Or, if, or you get out of it. Yeah. Or you just get out of it. But you just say, okay, I'm done. Bye. I don't want to talk to you. How do you not burn a bridge if you're in that situation? Um, I'd probably say some of the effect of, look. You're not going to like this. Mm. So you start with the emotional anchoring. Right. Interesting. Um, this isn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I can't do it anymore. Mm. And my problem here has been that I like you. Mm. I've always liked you. And the stuff that we've done together successfully has been phenomenal. And I would like nothing better than at some point in time in the future for us to be able to get back to that. Mm. But for right now, in order to preserve the memories of the positive things we've done, I gotta be, I'm, I'm out now. Wow. How do I remember that? So every time I'm in a situation, I can say that same thing. Well, it's a little bit of a sequence. Yeah. And the, the sequence is, um, we need to stop what we're doing right now. But if we're going to stop what we're doing right now, what everybody thinks of is where is this going in the future? Mm. So I got to, I got to create a, a point in time for the future that we're both happy with. So there's still and a bridge there. You know, there's still, there's still an Potential. opportunity for the future. Yeah. Maybe it's a year. Maybe it's never going to happen, but you keep it open. I'm open to it. I want, and, I, and I'm, I'm finishing positively, but I am finishing. Interesting. Yeah. Because you, the last words that I, the last two sentences, maybe even just the last sentence, are going to ring in your ears over and over and over and over. Because that's what your brain is always going to go back to, the last impression. How do I make you feel at the end? I make you, I make, make you feel valued. And you're going to appreciate the fact that I walked away without calling you names. Mm. But I walked away. Right. It's hard to do. Yeah. It, well, it's hard to get your, get your practice in. You got to practice, yeah. You know, you, you just, you're working on it a few times. Most of the time, what people have at the end is you know, the, the battle for the last word is when the last word is a cheap shot. Right. That's when people... Screw you too. Hang up. Right. right. And I'm going to call you back just to say screw you right back. And then I'm going to hang up. 
Yeah. You know, there's a battle of the last word's a problem and the last word's a cheap shot. But when the last word is a positive thing, it's not a problem. Mm, so always end in a pos with positive words. Right. Even and if you feel taken advantage of, even if they hurt you, even if they screwed you over, whatever, you should always try to end in a positive way. Yeah, without question. Because if you're talking to them, then your goal was to resolve things and to have a great relationship. Now, you might say that at the very beginning of the interaction, but it's more important to say it at the end. Mm. You know, my goal was always to have a great relationship with you. And if we can get out of this dynamic, that would be my goal again. But right now I'm out. Yeah. But understand that at any point in time when we can go back to working collaboratively, I'd love to do it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And so usually what it is is take, take what you said at the beginning and at least say it again at the end. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I like that. What is something that you did as a hostage negotiator with terrorists around the world that you use today in just common interactions. Is there something that you did at the height of like this intense conversation that you, you do on a daily basis? Pretty, that, pretty much everything we've oh, been talking about. Yeah. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a verbal observation on, on how they're processing things. You know, it's, it seems like... It seems like, it sounds important. like, it feels like you'll yeah. see all those things. Yeah. Yeah, the, that's the bread and butter of great hostage negotiations. Really? Yeah. It's having them be seen or heard yeah. If they understood. You know, people are taking actions to make a point. What happens if you can make the point without taking the action? Mm. They're taking actions to make a point. Right. And you're, you're saying you don't need to take that action because I hear you. Yeah, let me see what happens if I can, if I can, if you, and it makes no sense at all. But I'm going to take probably 90% of a terrorist agenda away just by making them feel hurt making him or her feel hurt. I, then then at, I'll deal with whatever I have to afterwards. But let's say I could only take away 10% of their agenda by making yeah. them feel hurt. Yeah. What, what if I could only take away 1% of their actions by making them feel hurt? That's worth the investment to me. It's worth it. Let me see what's left over after yeah. they feel hurt. It's, it's less, less fingers they're cutting off, less people they're blowing up, whatever, right? Yeah, one way or another. Less, yeah. What is, um, what's the best approach? Say I'm looking to buy a company. Right. I'm looking to acquire something. I really like this software, this tool, this agency. I want to buy them. What's the best approach without seemingly or thinking like, oh, if I come to them like I'm too needy, I really want them, then I'm giving them all the power. Right. What's the best approach of someone that wants to buy something? Yeah, um, completely counterintuitive. What are all their arguments for making you pay the high price? state them first mm. because what that actually does is it leaves them with nothing to say so eight mile on right. very nice right. exactly right eight mile on. yeah we used to we used to use that, that that clip from eight mile all the time so good articulate everything they got to say so for, if, for instance if if um i'm an agency you want to buy me right my company yeah. What would you say if I'm like, my business is growing, we're getting all this attention, we're helping clients with big results, we're, we're growing as fast as possible, and you're like, wow, this company's really growing, we gotta get them now before they're too big. What would you, if you can call me up on the phone, do you write me an email, do yeah. you meet, hey, I wanna meet for coffee, what's the best approach? Uh, In um, person, email, phone, video conferencing, if you could have it any way. All right, I'd say, look, um, uh, I'd probably say uh, right off the bat, like, like I'm completely blown away with what you're doing. You guys are phenomenal. You're on the upswing. You guys are killing it. Um, I'm going to seem like a cheapskate. <laughs> I'm going to seem like I'm trying to get something for nothing. So emotional anchoring. Yeah. Is it a ridiculous idea for us to talk about you selling me your company. Wow. Getting something for nothing? Is that what you said too? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because I've started off with appreciation. Yeah. I've lowered your expectations of me. Mm -hmm. And see, the last thing that I did also was I did what we refer to as a no-oriented question. Instead of saying, would you like to buy? Would you like me to, would you like to talk to me about selling your company? 
I'd say, is it a ridiculous idea for us to talk about you selling me your company? And what if I say, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous? And we're done. I never had a shot to begin with. Oh. See, this is about keeping me out of deals that either I'm never going to make or I don't want to make. So it saved you six months of your life, potentially, in a two-minute phone call. Right. But if they say, yeah, we're growing super fast, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be hard for me to really want to sell right now, but, you know, if you made me a great offer, I'd be open. Yeah. Then I'd say, sounds to me like there's just no way that I'm going to be able to ever make you happy. Because um, I need a great offer. Yeah. You, if you say something like that to me, what you're actually doing is trying to get a really high bid out of me to soothe your ego. Mm. You want to go back to the, the employees team. and say, you know what? We're worth $150 million. And I turned it down. Mm. Because in five years, we're going to be worth $450 million. Wow. So that kind, of a, that kind of a question is, you want to bid for me to make you feel good. Mm. What made you want to get into um, becoming a negotiator in the FBI? Why did you think this would be fun for me or something you wanted to do? Well, I was originally a SWAT guy. And uh, you know, before I got into law enforcement, I figured to be a SWAT guy. Like, I'm a medium-sized guy. Yeah. So I figured, well, I got to do martial arts. And so then in college, and then I then I ripped my knee up really badly in, in college in martial arts, and that was what we ended up being the turning point in negotiation because then I was on a SWAT team in uh, with the FBI when I was in Pittsburgh, and was on a SWAT team there, and then I tried out for the bureau's version of the mm-hmm. SEALs, wow. which is the hostage rescue team, and when I tried out for the hostage rescue team HRT, then I re-injured my knee again, and then I realized. There's only so many times doctors can put it back together. <laughs> it's tough. Humpty Dumpty, how many times yeah, can yeah. the doctors put you back? So after they got the knee put back together the second time, I looked at hostage negotiation. I didn't know what negotiators did. Mm. You know, it sounded both cool and easy. Right. You know, and, and I thought, ah, I could talk to Terrace. I remember literally thinking, <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to Terrace. I'll do that. Sure. Okay. And so then, but I, and then I, that, that actually was a big turning point, getting onto the team in the New York City office. Because originally, the woman who ran the team just tried to shoo me away. Because mm. I, had, I had no credentials. Right. I just figured I could do it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm from sort of a can-do, pitch-in kind of world. Yeah. I grew up in a small town in Iowa. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, figure it out, do it, get it done. Right. Move on to the next thing. Where in Iowa? Waverly? So, yeah, Waverly. I've been to Waverly, so that's why. Yeah, that's a mecca of Iowa culture, probably. Is, is right? it? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm from Mount Pleasant, Iowa. All right, yeah. Southeast corner of the state. It is about 35 miles south of the future birthplace of James T. Kirk. Okay. Just for all you Star Trek. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So what was the first um, negotiation process like for you at the FBI? What was it? How long have you been at the FBI for? And well, what was the re- outcome? Yeah, the first real deal was uh, bank robbery with hostages in Brooklyn. Your first deal was a bank robbery? My first FBI gig, if you will. Wow. And this happens once every two decades. Uh, bank robberies with hostages are rare, rare wow. events. Okay. Where was the bank? It was in, it was in Brooklyn at 7th and Carroll. It was Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh-huh. And there we were. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> no, but I was, uh, I, was gonna, I was actually scheduled to do a terrorism-related interview that morning. And I was, a, I was a, not quite a year out of negotiation training. And... Uh, Part of mine, Charlie Bodwin, came in and says, it's a bank ride with hostages in Brooklyn. Let's go. Wow. And you were in Manhattan at this time, yeah, right? Yeah, I was you were in living- Manhattan, yeah. So uh, Charlie and I, and we were both par- nursing bad knees at the time. He actually had a bad <laughs> left knee. I had a bad right knee. So you got your wheelchair, your crutches. Just your- about, yeah. <laughs> Hobbling around. We hob- hobble around, and so we, we, we pull up to the uh, bank robbery, and we're too close to the crisis site. And we didn't realize we're like right on top of where the bank is where the bad guys were so two 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 guys with bad knees bail out of a car and low crawl basically <laughs> through the inner perimeter to to where the negotiation team was being set up and that was mm. that was my first gig okay and now is the team in a van like it is in the movies where you're like have a van and you've got the right. radios no, and if you can't set up someplace then you get a van gotcha and nypd had a van but we didn't need it we set up in a bank across the street took over a, it was chemical bank at the time and just took over the bank. 
and set up the negotiation room right across the street and wow. started rock and roll. It took us two hours from the moment the bank alarm went out to the first contact was two hours. Two hours. Is that quick or is that? You know, that's probably standard. Okay. Because it takes everybody a while to get there. Two hours. So they had to wait for two hours to till they got any communication. Well, that's what we thought. But the bad guys inside were really tricky. And they and that was that was one of the first things that I began to learn lessons about business negotiation because the, the the organizer inside was one shrewd guy, hmm. and it's a cliche in a business world that if you're sitting at the table with some guy who wants to make them seem powerless, that's an influential guy, hmm. a guy who always said, "Look, I don't have control over what's going on here. You know, I got a CEO, I got all these people. Anybody that points to negotiators away from the table." The harder they work to make you, themselves seem powerless, the more influential they are because really? they don't want you to corner them at the table. Because they don't have the decision. They can't make the decision. Well, they can. They don't want you to know it. Yeah, right. They're exactly. hiding that. They're acting like they can't make it. Right, right, right. And this guy in that bank, he just kept saying, you know, these other guys that I'm here with, they're so dangerous. I don't know what they're going to do. And he was extremely calm. And at first, we just thought we were dealing with an inadequate personality, mm. somebody who just had no power. But we found out after the fact that he was one of the most controlling guys. And the guys he took to that bank robbery, they didn't even know they were going to rob the bank. They thought they were going to burglarize a cash machine. Wow. He was he was manipulating everybody. So my first solid dose with that with somebody like that was like one of the best business lessons I ever learned. Wow. What happened? How long did the process go for? 12 hours. 12 a little hours. over 12 hours in total. How many hostages? There were three hostages inside, two women and a man. They had... Uh, they had guns. They had everything, I'm assuming. Bad guys rolled in. This guy thought everything through in advance, and he rolled in with a gun that looked like a three fifty seven. was actually not hmm. because he wanted everybody to think he had a three fifty seven. So the first thing he does when he rolls in the bank is uh, he takes a two female tellers hostage. He hits one of them in the head with the three fifty seven. He sticks the barrel in the other one's mouth and pulls the trigger. Oh my gosh! And it's she thinks about terrifying. Yeah, she's frightened out of her mind. She thinks it, you know, was just uh, an empty chamber, which is what he wanted her to think. And then and when he when he dropped the hammer on an empty chamber, he said, "Now open the vault." And they wasted no time getting that vault open. And by then. The police had shown up. We surrounded the bank. And, so and the vault was open. They got cash and bags or whatever. They were getting ready to get out when we surrounded them. You surrounded them. So how did they get out? Well, they, you know, we had them trapped inside. And so we went, we went through a really long negotiation. I mean, this guy's thought everything through. I mean, so you're on the phone with him. You get a hold of him. He gets a hold of you. How does that work? We uh, call the bank. The first thing we do is we, we try to isolate the phone lines. Right. So, but so we just got in on a, we connected our equipment to a, a phone and just called in on the bank phone, and this was, uh, and that ended up being the way we communicated the entire time. And he picked it up the first time, or yeah, well, because he's smart, he wants to, he wants to figure. First of all, he, he wants, wants to, to get figure away out what free. we're doing. <laughs> he wants to get away, and he he also realizes that if he's talking to us, there's a pretty good chance we're not coming in. Right. If he's talking to us, and also if, if he realizes. He's got to manage the, th the risk level. You know, he's got to talk to us in really measured tones. And so he knows as long as he's talking to us and sound and reasonable, we're probably not going to break down right. the doors. But if they're sounding crazy, then you're going to come in. Then we're going to come in. Huh. So he sounded reasonable. He was... Right. Like, right. what was the conversation like? Well, he started off right off the bat by telling... I was the second negotiator. The first thing he'd done was he had already actually... We didn't know he'd called the precinct... Before we got there, he called the precinct and said they wanted to surrender. Which also then, that, that that's for, on his perspective, he thinks that that means we're going to drop our guard. Mm. And it's very much like a really shrewd negotiator says, look, I want to make a deal. You know, and if you get a negotiator says, you know, let's do a win-win deal. Right. I mean, the sooner win-win comes out of somebody's mouth across the table. More to relaxed. Me that's, that, well, that's an automatic mark of somebody's trying to. To, oh really to rip me off oh interesting because he's trying to get me to relax he or she sure sure you know if i look at you and say hey man hey, you know let's do a win-win deal here you need to be putting your hands over your wallet really because i'm going after it that's funny because i'm always thinking about you know i'm trying to come from a place of win-win in all my relationships and business right. deals right now in my life right 
but I'm honestly not trying to like screw someone out of a, you know, by right. saying that I'm really like, let's make sure that you win. I win in this business deal or, you know, whatever's happening. But it's right. different maybe when there's someone who's stealing something. And, well, it's, it's context too. But And then if, right, right. if the first thing that you say is like, if you say to me, look, I want to make sure that this is good for you and I, and I want it to be good for me at the same time. Right. You know, you're you're expressing a win-win. But if, if I sit down, I, I was I was saying like, look, Lewis, you know, I need uh, let's do a win-win here. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you I don't want to pay you anything. Mm. The sooner it comes out of my mouth. Oh, interesting. So you should negotiate first before saying that is what you're saying. Well, you you start thinking about stuff other than money. What I'm, you know, what I'm really telling you is I don't want to give you any money. Gotcha. In no. that context. Right. Gotcha. Right. But the sooner somebody starts trying to give you a deal, it's a great move to get the other side to relax. Right, right, right. Okay. So what happened next? Well, um, he called the precinct and said they wanted to surrender. So what he the deal he wanted to do was, he said, put a van out front. We'll all get in the van and we'll drive to the precinct. Okay. Right, that's absurd. <laughs> right, like you'll drive to the precinct. Okay. Right, like, but that's an escape plan. Right. So, but because it came out, half that information came out when we actually got to the bank at the beginning. All the top brass had showed up. They figured, you know, they're half paying attention. They figured they it should be twenty minutes and it's over. Because that was the information when we first got there, that they wanted to surrender. Uh -huh. And as stupid as that sounds, a year earlier, a hijacked plane had come into JFK. And in that hijacking, the hijacker said he wanted to surrender as soon as the plane touched down. And that was, in fact, what happened. So there was some precedent in New York for somebody wanting to surrender right away. Mm -hmm. So if you're half paying attention, you're thinking, oh, this is the same as this stupid hijacker a year ago. Right. Well, it wasn't. The hijacker that came in, a year earlier, he wanted he wanted to get into the U.S. to get out of his country, and he figured jail in the U.S. was better than life in his Interesting. country. Interesting, and he he just needed a free ride to the U.S. Wow, <laughs> that's why he, he hijacked a plane. That's funny. He didn't know he was going to spend life in jail. Wow, but that he and so there was some precedent for it. So all the bosses show up, and they're just hanging out outside, shaking hands. They're not paying attention to what's going on. You know, pretty soon they wonder what's taking the negotiator so long. They're looking at their watches. They're like, we've been here an hour. You know, these guys said they want to surrender an hour ago. Why isn't he out? Well, they were stalling and they were trying to escape. And and we also found out the guy on the inside was, um, he was burning money in the basement. The bank was under construction. At the bank, wow. And what he was doing was he stashed a couple of hundred thousand dollars inside the construction. And then he burned a pile of money in the bank and he want, and so he figured I don't have to get away with the money I just got to get away if I hide and enough hide money it, in I the come walls get it later. I'll come back and get it later wow so he was a cagey guy he was a really cagey smart. guy smart and at uh, at 8.30 that night right at 12 hours later he walked out of the front of the bank and we put those golden handcuffs on <laughs> he couldn't get out huh no we had him we had him to, but even even up to the last minute I saw, because I was inside, I saw the video. When he, he's looking around. He came out real slow, and he was looking left and right the whole time. I mean, right up to the moment that our SWAT guys actually put the hands on him, he was looking for any opportunity Boy, to escape. Run. Yeah, he, he never lost his poise the whole time. Wow, interesting. So how did you guys finally get him to surrender or to... to... Well, he got, when, when I got on the phone with him, I was part of a change of strategy. And I was going to be... Something wasn't working for a while. Right. Well, we'd yeah. slowed it down, and I was going to be the really tough, nice guy. <laughs> right. Like, I'm going to... My job to get on the phone was to be the immovable, nice guy. <laughs> and the nicer you are, the more immovable you could be. Mm. You know, you know, you know and I'll, forgive me for picking on Mr. Donald Trump right now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the style of being... You can be very aggressive without... Or very assertive without being aggressive. And his style is... He wants to yell at people. You know, he wants to intimidate his way in. You don't have to give up that much assertion. You just you don't, you don't want to be that mean. You don't want to be that hard on people. For example, what do you mean? Like how? Well, you know, there's there's a, hey, we're, we're in L. A. Yes. Um, there's a great guy here in town. His name is Tom Girardi. Voted top trial attorney in California several years in a row by the Bar Association. He gets a voted top trial attorney so many times that when they put it on the front page, they say again. Wow. So he comes in and he's a guest in my class at USC. 
And he stepped, and I know he's a top trial attorney, but I don't know his style. I figure he's going to be an attack dog. Because I spent so much time in New York, you know, I'm used to attack dog attorneys. And Tom walks into the class and he says, you know, the key to negotiation is being nice and gentle. Now, what Tom does by being nice is get you to drop your guard. And Tom is an immovable, unrelenting opponent. And that's why he's so successful, and he's ridiculously nice about it. <laughs> like, he smiles, and he chats with people, and he always talks about how we'll collaborate with each other in the future. He's, you, you get into an argument with him, and immediately he'll bend it where he's talking with you about how you and I are going to be successful together 10 years from now mm. or in the future, which is the same thing a hostage negotiator does. Like if you're barricading the bank, I'm going to say my first goal is to get you out of there alive. Well, I picked a point in the future that we can collaborate on. Tom Girardi does this instinctively, and he's just super nice about it. Mm. I mean, like you, either you're going to cooperate with him because you like him so much, he's never going to let up on you, or more than likely, you're going to say something accidentally, mm. and and he gets people saying stuff accidentally, and he and then he can and then he doesn't jump on you if you say something accidentally. Right. He lets you say so many things accidentally. What do you mean accidentally? You well, like you know, he loves to get people on on uncovered emails that they never should have written. Mm. Like if you if you send Tom an email saying Tom, let's go have lunch together, he will not email you back saying okay. Because he doesn't put anything in emails because that's the downfall of almost every single lawsuit. Somebody who's done something wrong is going to put it in an email. Wow. And Tom knows if he's nice to the other side long enough, he's going to figure out where those emails are. So, and that's what people do all the time. You know, lawsuits are uncovered. People get into trouble with what they put in an emails. When, wow. When they, when they say, hey, they send a, uh, an email to somebody else, they say, hey, you know, we, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. And a person sends an email back saying, like, yeah, it's okay. Nobody's ever going to find out. Oh, my gosh. In today's day and age, people put stuff in emails. And so Tom knows he's just relentlessly nice, mm. relentless, and the most charming guy you ever met in your life. Wow. So you don't have to be aggressive. To get what you want. To get what you want. Interesting. Okay. I've got a bunch of questions for you that I want to ask about this, but I want to do a role play first if you're cool with it. I'd love to and do you say you do this in your class. Do I have to wear a special outfit? <laughs> no. <laughs> we're yeah. going to wear uniforms. Wait, we're we're going to wear football exactly, uniforms. Yes. I'll be a referee. Okay, perfect. And you'll be a wide receiver. <laughs> we can do that. I'll call you for illegal <laughs> procedure. <laughs> perfect. Off sides. There you go. Uh, but you do this in your class, right? Because you teach at yeah, USC yeah, yeah, role, role Business play. School. And what do the role play usually consist of? What all right. So I, I, say, I say, all right, I'm going to ask you to volunteer to role play with me in front of the class. Okay. And... I want you to know, just in case you're worried about role playing with a hostage negotiator in front of everybody, just ease your mind, just so you won't worry. I promise you the experience is going to be horrible. <laughs> Perfect. And you probably get more out of it than anybody else in the classroom. Mm, okay. All right, so here's a role play. You volunteered. You, you yes. agree. I'm a bank robber. You're a hostage negotiator. I'm trapped in a bank. Yes. You and your colleagues have got me surrounded. It's your job to talk me out. It's just like your first case. Right. Okay. You got. There's only four restrictions. You can't give me transportation. You can't give me weapons. You can't give me drugs or alcohol. And there's no exchange of hostages. You can't offer to come in if I offer to let everybody go. You can't offer to send my mom in if I let everybody go. Nobody I can't comes in. I can't get anyone to come out. People, people only come out, nobody comes no out. No exchange for... No, you know, like Eddie Murphy did a movie no where he walked for a into person. the bank. Let me talk to you. You can't do that. You can't walk so into no the bank. No one can come in. No one comes only in. Only people can come out. Only people come out. So those those are your only four restrictions. Can something else come in? Sure. If you, if you don't break any of those other restrictions. No alcohol, drugs. No alcohol, no weapons, no drugs, no transportation, no okay. hostage exchange. Okay. We'll do we'll do the negotiation over the phone. All right. When you when you're ready, say ring ring. I'll pick up. Ring ring. I need a call in sixty seconds or she dies. Let me see what I can do on that. Okay, uh, you got fifty seven seconds to do something. Well, Chris, we don't have cars that quickly. Tell me to kill her right now. You've got fifty five seconds, as a matter of fact. Or are you telling me you're gonna give me a car? Let me see what I can do on that and get back to I you. I heard you say that before. 
You've got 50. You've got 45 seconds. Car, I, yes or no? I need to make sure she's still alive before I can get you a car. She's alive. I need proof. 43 seconds. I need to hear her on the phone. Nope. No, absolutely not. 40 seconds. I want to help you get exactly what you car, need. Give me You tell me you didn't give me a car? I'm going to do my best to get it for you no, as I've quickly as I can. I've heard do my best. Are you telling me is that a yes to a car? 35 seconds. I'm going to do my best to get you a car. That sounds quickly. like a no. I, I need you a little more time seconds. than 30 seconds because we can't you get the car that quickly. You can't give me a car then. You have just said you are going I'm to gonna give me a car. I'm going to get you a car. Just give me a little bit more time to yes get it Yes on the for car. You. I'll get you a car. Yes on the car. Okay, you got 25 seconds because that car is everywhere. If you can give me one, you give me one. It's right out front right now. Give us a few more minutes and we'll get you a car as quickly as we can. No, you got 25 seconds. You're going to have to give me a little bit of help here. I don't have to give you anything. You got 20 seconds. We're going to do our best to get you a car. Yeah, you just said you were going to give me a car. Now you're back. As quickly as we can. You're saying yes on the car. Yes on the 15 car. 15 seconds, I kill her. Okay. Well, we just need to make sure we have a few more minutes to get yes the, on car the car for you. Yes. Okay. 10 seconds. Okay. Our men are on it right now. Okay. We'll stop that. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> literally. It's intense. Everything that you did was wrong. <laughs> no, no, your strategy is on the money. Okay. See, and I would only change how you tried to implement the strategy. Okay. But you, um, you trying to feel me out a little bit. Uh huh. You got a great tone of voice. Uh huh. Like I was attacking you like crazy. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting you hard. Yeah. And I actually used one. I used the Donald Trump voice, basically. Uh huh. Now you didn't respond. You didn't you didn't lose your stuff at all. Right. You stayed very calm the whole time. Okay. That's the key. That's not easy to do. No, because I was feeling it inside. I was like, oh man. That's very impressive that you, your voice didn't come up one iota in that negotiation. And then with that particular voice as a counterpart, it's not at least a bit unusual where we start talking over each other. Right. You didn't talk over me once. Right. Is that a key? To yeah. Not talk over. It's not critical. try to interrupt or secret to gaining the upper hand in a negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control. Now, I'm coming at you as a very control-oriented negotiator. Right. As soon as you don't struggle with me over control, you actually begin to gain an advantage. Because so, then you feel like you're in control. Right. And you if, don't have to try to gain it anymore. Right, right. I'm more than likely going to start dropping my... If I'm a control-freak guy. If I want to talk all the time, I'm a control-freak guy. Mm -hmm. Control-freak uh, negotiators who want to talk all the time, they feel out of control when they're not talking. So you want to get them to the point where they don't talk, but they don't talk because they're relaxed, not because they're trying to seize control. Right. So you did you, you did a real nice job with that. Now the the only thing, one, another thing that we teach is, see, you're not going to give me a car. Right. And you're trying to make it sound like you were going to. Yeah. Now I teach how to say no. Uh huh. And and then you want to feel other ways of saying because the real answer to that. Just like at the very beginning of my book, you're supposed to look look at me and say, how am I supposed to do that? Mm, so poise it back to a question. Right. Uh, uh, a how question. An open-ended question. Well, not just open-ended, how. Okay. How is a key to life. Yes is nothing without how. So, you know, if I, and, and you could also start talking about how without talking about yes. Mm, so just say, what I even how say. Would I, you could say, how would I do that? Would I say, I'd love to get you what you need. How would I do that? Just or how would I do that? How would I do that? So give them the control to figure out the solution. Right, right, right. How am I supposed to get you the car in that time frame? Because mm. that's what you're trying to express. There actually is a time problem here. Right. In 60 seconds, how am I supposed to get you a car? Right, right. That That's different than we can get a car. We just need 60 more seconds. Right. <laughs> we need more time. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because okay. now, now I think you're ducking me. Okay. But if you instead you say, like, how am I, you know, of course, the cars are out here right away. But first of all, I gotta I gotta tell everybody what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. I don't need anybody to get surprised. Let's talk through the details of how this is gonna get done. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, what got you here in the first place? Mm. You know how do how do how do you find yourself into this kind of a situation? How do I make sure I get you out of there alive? The succession of how questions. How am I supposed to promise to get you a car if I don't know that she's going to come out alive? Mm. You take what you want and make it the path to what I want. Mm. You know, how am I supposed to get you in here if it doesn't benefit me also? Right. 
So as, as soon as in any negotiation, what I want is now a means of getting what you want, then that changes the dynamic right away. How does someone develop that confidence? Uh, so I'm gonna break that down into two parts. Yes. The type of confidence and developing the confidence. Because there's a lot of empty, vacuous confidence out there. Like I am like- False confidence. Fa the false confidence. And I, you know, this one guy we were talking to about a possible investment in a company, you know, I, I pointed out, you know, how I thought the numbers were flawed. And then the guy said, well, I'm confident I can make these numbers anyway. <laughs> Mm. And I'm like, all right, so we're walking away from you right now mm. because you just told me you have confidence in, you, in the things that I just pointed out to you that were flawed instead of actually listening to what I said. Now, the confidence that you spoke about a moment ago, the way you lived it mm -hmm. and what you said, it wasn't confidence. It was confidence in connecting. And that's the critical point. With people. With people. Mm -hmm. Connecting with somebody and the desire to connect with them which is also the whole point of the negotiation. The Black Swan Method is about succeeding with people, not at their, not at their expense. You know, getting better at negotiation, not necessarily at the expense of other people. In point of fact, making the other pe person's position better also. Mm. Not, so not, not hurting game. them. Not hurting. But them succeeding and you succeeding. Right, because you want to repeat business. Yes. And if you hurt them, they're not going to repeat. Right. So connecting with people, negotiating with people, that's your confidence is a desire for that and a genuine sincerity and enthusiasm for it. How does someone do that when they know what they want is not what the other person wants? Well, and that's it, only if it's short term. Gotcha. And then, then if it really gets at the risk of that, you make what you want the path to what they want. Like, uh, you know, I love seeing a black swan method thrown, showing up in the real world. So, of course, somebody sends me a clip from Shark Tank. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Kevin O'Leary got black swanned. Oh, okay. Tell me. So, one of our, our go-to lines when somebody's giving you an unacceptable offer or something you can't deal with or something very difficult for you, I used to say to, you know, to kidnappers, how are we supposed to pay if we don't know the hostage is alive? Mm -hmm. They want to get paid. I got to know that your hostage is alive. How are we supposed to pay you if we don't know you're going to let them go? They want to get paid. I want to get the hostage out. I'm making my goals their sequence. So how am I supposed to do that as some form of how is a great leveling the playing field question when someone's coming at you hard. Mm. So what happened with Kevin? Kevin O'Leary did classic. All right, so this is my offer. Take it or leave it. No discussion. Yes or no. You got to answer me right away. This is what I want. Can't talk to anybody else. And the guy looks at him and says, how am I supposed to do that? And then he says, how am I supposed to agree to those terms and pay you back your money? Now, O'Leary, initially, this started with O'Leary basically saying, like, yes and no, right. or get out of my face. Mm -hmm. You got five seconds, make a decision, I'm yeah, out. or I'm out. Instead, they hit him with a couple of how questions, and then there's a sequencing. O'Leary wants his money back. Uh -huh. So how am I supposed to do that and protect your investment? And so suddenly now all of a sudden, now he's not angry, but now he's not, he's back on his heels. He's trying he, to think. He, he's see, <laughs> see him thinking. And at that point in time, since they've created so much space in a negotiation, now Barbara Corkin jumps in. Right. Now there's some time. That's some, some, some people are a 10 second window. There's a, yeah. And, and a better deal is opening. Uh-huh. And Kevin looks at her and says, hey, are, are you in? Are you out? You know, I thought you were out. <laughs> And, and so then, but now he's engaged in a full-on negotiation. It's a back and forth exchange. And these guys are still hitting him with, like, how are we supposed to protect your investment and give you those kind of terms? Mm -hmm. And then finally, they, they get a great deal teased out that O'Leary is still not ready to jump on. And Barbara says, you know what? I'll take that deal. And yeah. she jumps in and she gets it. Wow. So great negotiations about succeeding with people and creating the opportunity for good things to happen. Because until they did that, Barbara Corcoran was out. But mm -hmm. they created some space, they asked some legitimate questions, and suddenly Barbara says, there's a great deal in front of me, I'm gonna jump back in. Right. What would you say is the most important word to use in any negotiation? Wow. Um, not use, but come to grips with, no. The word no. Um, no is a great word to hear. If you're because trying to make the negotiation? When I'm trying to make the negotiation. Because 
Empathy is about what it is for the other side, not what it is for you. It's not about you. So when you say no, you feel safe. I'm protecting myself. I'm guarding my right. deal or whatever the side of that I have. I'm, I'm not giving in to something I don't want. Right. And as soon as you do that, you're more willing to explore options. Okay, no for this, but maybe what about this, this, or this? Right, right. Or I may say, look, does this, does this look like a bad idea? And you might say, no, it doesn't look like a bad idea, but I need these things. Mm -hmm. Which you, having feel safe, will now tell me honestly, because you don't feel obligated. If I'd have said, does this look like a good deal to you? You might say, yes, it looks like a good deal, but, the erasing word, I need these things. But you're afraid if you said, had said yes in the first place, you're now on the hook. So you're not going to be as honest with me about those things. So coming to grips with what yes and no really means is one of the major first turning points in anybody's negotiation journey as a great negotiator. Say that one more time. Coming to grips with what yes and no really mean is the first major turning point mm. in anybody's negotiation journey. Because you think yes is success, and it's not. And you think no is failure, and it's not. Why is yes not a success? Yes, at best, is aspiration only. You know, the phrase hope is not a strategy. Yes is hope alone. Hope is inadequate alone. And at best, it's an aspiration. Most commonly, it's counterfeit. It's fake. It's a fake yes. So if someone says, hey, I want to do this deal with you, and you say, yeah, I'm open to that, or yeah, that works for me. You're saying it's not 100% until the deal terms are laid out over paper and people are going back and forth, or what do you mean? Well, about 80% of the time, I want to know what your deal terms are so I can shop them. Ooh. And if I've said yes, you're going to lay those terms out to me. And now I'm free to shop them and start playing you off somebody else. Interesting. And that is such a problem in the business world, recognize that mm. a lot of salespeople are now taught to say, are we the vendor of choice? Well, you're, you're going for yes there. Now, if you're being played, nobody's ever, if they're playing you, they're not going to tell they're you the say truth. No, yeah, yeah. They say, yeah. They're not going to say, well, thank God you asked, because as a matter of fact, you're not. <laughs> We're just pumping you for information. Right. We want free consulting. Yeah. Like, nobody's ever going to say that. If they mm -hmm. were already lying to you, they're going to lie to you about that question, too. Mm -hmm. and so this whole the seduction of yes, because we love to hear it. Mm. Like, yes, the heavens part, the angels sing, the sun shines. And that is such a seduction that people exploit us regularly by mm -hmm. telling us yes. Yeah, it's interesting. So when you hear a no, or when someone hears a no, what is the first thing they should think in a negotiation? Well, it depends upon uh, how the no came up. Like, you know, in Never Split the Difference, we mm -hmm. point out no could mean not yet. Or no is no to these circumstances, which doesn't eliminate other circumstances. Like, no could be I need time to think. Like, no is mm -hmm. almost never rejection. Mm -hmm. if, if it's come up unexpectedly, it's really, a, uh, it's a signal that there's another path. Versus, ah, I got to quit and go home. No, it's failure. I'm horrified with no. And that, ain't, that ain't the case. Mm -hmm. So we intentionally try to get it all the time. Like if, if getting someone to say no as a result of a calibrated question is so powerful. You intentionally try to get people to say no. Intentionally try to get people to say no. That that may be the only thing that some people learn. Because I, I get emails on LinkedIn all the time. Like, hey, I, I use the phrase, have you given up on this project? And I, my close rate is so exceeding <laughs> everybody else that I, on my company, that I should come work for you mm. and teach this. And my thought is like, I'm, I'm glad you're making a lot more money right now, but you're just scratching the surface. Mm. To, and you think, because you're comparing yourself to your peers who are in the middle of the bell curve, that if you just moved up the bell curve one notch, you now see all these people way behind you. Mm -hmm. You don't have any idea how much more upside you have. Right. Wow. What is the, when you hear a no, what do you think next? 
in a, in a, in a negotiation? Well, I always hear no's that I want to hear. You hear the no, you set it up. Yeah. I, so I is, it, it, is it asking for something so extreme first? Well, for example, um, there's a lot of stuff, let's say, about the particular deal uh -huh. that I know you don't know. Okay. I mean, Ronald Reagan says if you're explaining, you're losing. But I got to give you some information at some point in time, right. which is explanation. So I'll say something like, all right, here's what I think you're up against. Here's what I think the challenges are that you face. Are you against me sharing some ideas with you? No. Right. Now, I've just teed up. You just, you got no problem with that. Now, I, I can't, if I got 15 things I got to share with you, I probably only get away with three. Mm -hmm. Because it's, each one is a lot. It's good information. You got to absorb it. I got to let you think about it. We got to go in small doses. But I will always, we are CDA, call to action, call to next step. However we close out, we always close out with a no. You know, me, the Black Swan team, really? everybody that we, we coach, always close out. Are you against doing this? Are you against me sharing some ideas? Does this look stupid to you? Is, is this a ridiculous idea? Like you can turn any one of your yes questions huh. into a no question, which, which is, is a 10 yes. times more valuable. Really? Because I've heard in the past from people that says, you know, you want to get people saying yes, 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 leading into the close, to a sale, to whatever, right. right? It's like getting them saying yes. Right. But I'm hearing you say, get them to say no. Right. Why is no more powerful than yes? I think that, uh, that, that you're, what you're referring to is called the yes momentum. Uh-huh. And I think that has been so overused. Yeah. And not only overused, but it's also been, everybody's been, they've been flim flamed, they've been bamboozled, you know, they've been conned by that two or three times mm. they're yes battered and then your problem is they feel like it's a trick or something or some strategy you're yeah. not a trickster mm -hmm. but you're engaging in the same methodology that the trickster used interesting you know the african phrase when you're bitten by a snake you're afraid of ropes uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. there are a lot of really legitimate people that are not trying to to flim flam somebody but the flim flam artists use that on them. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the timeshare industry has a, has a very bad reputation. And some of the timeshares are, are clearly very valuable because I know people that have them and are, love them. Simultaneously, there are a lot of people out there that are hustling and con of people. And there's a whole industry of, that we've coached some of these people on getting people out of timeshares because they got them on a yes momentum. Mm. Now they got a timeshare that's going to bankrupt them. Now, they don't remember exactly how that happened, but it was probably this yes momentum. So they weren't conscious of it, but as soon as they hear it again, even from a close, trusted friend, they got burned and, and they, they got an instinctively negative reaction to the yes momentum. Interesting. So what's the no, is it no momentum? What's the, what's like, what is this process of getting the no? Well, you, you know, you're getting a no and you're getting, you're getting the information. You know, uh -huh. no typically triggers um, implementation, next steps. Got it. But a no is really a yes. Yeah. It sounds like, would you be against me sharing some interesting ideas for you? No, I'm not against it. Exactly. Right. Okay, cool. Here's the next step. And, mm -hmm. and probably if I'd have said, are you against me sharing some interesting ideas for you? Your more likely answer is, no, I'm not against it, but I only got 15 minutes. Yeah. Awesome. If I stick to the 15 minutes or less, I got your undivided attention. If I go over 15, you're going to start to get anxious because mm -hmm. you're worried about your clock. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's a secondary thing. Like um, if we set up an appointment, is it a ridiculous idea for me to take up 13 minutes of your time? <laughs> right. Not, a, not 10, not five, but something in between. Right. Now, I know I want nine minutes. I got I it timed out. You know, I, I, I call this BDA line. They're always showing a plate. Uh -huh. They're not getting killed for that anymore. Are they more efficient? No, they just changed the time they said they were going to show up. Uh -huh. You know, you, you're, I'm sitting on a tarmac in LAX. Plane can't get, can't get to the gate. We're there 20 minutes early. The airline is, hey, we're here 20 minutes early. We promised an on-time arrival. We're here 20 minutes early. They won't let us get to the gate. And you're sitting there thinking like, this airport is so stupid. This plane is big. They saw it coming. Yeah. They got radar. Yeah. We're not a surprise. <laughs> right, right. Well, point of fact, the, uh, the airport said, you guys show, said you were showing up at three. We ain't opening up this gate till three. 
Now, you're sitting there on the airplane. You're not mad at the airline. You're mad at the airport. But in fact, the airline knew how long they were going to be early. Right. But who gave you back time in your life? Mm -hmm. I call you on the phone. I say, Louis, I need need 13 minutes. Uh You give me 15 because you ain't got 13 on your calendar. I get done at 9. And I'm like, okay. And, And you're sitting there like, holy cow. Hey, you, you just gave me back time in my day. Everybody else is taking it away. Now mm. you love me. Mm. Next time I call, you're picking that phone right yeah. up. He's not going to waste my time. Exactly. Wow. So I like these questions to, to get, would you be against me doing this? Would, are you, uh, what's another way you could say a no question? It's usually like, is it a ridiculous idea? Are you against? Our phone call start with, is now a bad time to talk? Mm. Instead of, have you got a few minutes? Right. Because, you know, we're, people feel safe when they say no. They feel safe. You feel, why, you feel why safe. Why is that? Yeah, that's, you know, I get, <laughs> I'm probably because we get flim-flammed over yes. Uh-huh. And we've been flim-flammed so many times that no gives an automatic feeling of protection. You know, and I, I talked mm. about this because I told you I want to talk about how you interview in some of your other interviews. Yeah. Andrew Huberman. Yes, he's great. Like, I've become acquainted with Andrew. Uh-huh. Fascinating dude. Like, his first interview of him I heard on with you. Uh-huh. And I'm like, this is a great interview. I got to listen to everything this guy says. Mm. Fascinating. And so then I catch him on another podcast. And I'm, I'm falling asleep. I'm like, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Andrew was awesome when uh. he was on Lewis. Now, I can't. I, I, this is a cure for insomnia. What's going on? <laughs> And I actually went back and I compared the interviewing styles. Really? Interesting. And there's a very difficult skill in the Black Swan Method also. Huh. And you were really good at it. You were really good at several. But you paraphrase really well. And paraphrasing is, is a sound simple dic- dictionary definition. But it keeps the conversation going in more digestible bites. And I went back and I listened to your interview of Huberman several times for I realized when you interviewed, you were genuinely connecting and interested in him. Right. And you paraphrase frequently. Because it's very complex ideas. I'm like, okay, well, let me simplify this so I can understand and other people can understand. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it also helps you stay focused. Yeah. You're a much better listener if you're focused on doing that. Now, the other dude that's interviewing Andrew... (laughs) He's trying to show Andrew how smart he is. Mm. So his, you know, his, he, he wanted to use all the scientific vernacular, uh, which Andrew likes to speak in very plain terms. And he wanted to show how smart he was. Mm-hmm. And then consequently, I think Andrew was having trouble keeping up with the questions. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. they were so complicated. Yeah. The interviewer was trying to show, show off. off. Yeah. For the audience, I'm as smart as Andrew Huberman. You don't bother with that at all. Mm-hmm. And you you were genuinely interested and you're very conscious of your audience. So, well, your audience sort of losing track and falling asleep like this other guy. Right, right. If I'm falling asleep, then I need to, you know, reset the interview. I need to paraphrase it so I can stay focused and present too. Something I learned early on, thanks for the compliment. I appreciate it. And I think it, it stemmed from an insecurity and a lack of confidence early in my 20s, once I was kind of getting into the... So you're saying you, you're a flawed human being? Very flawed human being, yes. <laughs> After I got done playing arena football and lost my identity, I was like, what am I going to do wow. with the rest of my life? Like, this was my whole Why? goal, right, was playing right. professional football. Now I got injured, I can't play anymore. What do I do? Do I really have skills? Am I talented? Is anyone going to hire me? I didn't know. Right. And I started going to these networking events in Columbus, Ohio, to try to meet people kind of these business networking events. And I, I remember I was like, wow, the, everyone's, you know, 5, 10, 20 years older than me. They're all wearing suits. I, you know, I have one sport jacket and a T-shirt, right? Uh, everything about this environment is designed to make you feel inadequate. Exactly, everything. And, and I didn't have a job and all these different things. And I was like, okay, what value can I bring to this networking event, right? I'm not as smart or talented or successful as these professionals. And I remember being very intimidated and I said, you know what, I'm just going to go here and have fun and ask interesting questions and listen. And I'm not going to try to act Actually like- Actually listen. I'm just going to listen 
to whoever's in front of me. I'm not going to look around and see who else is here, who's more powerful, who's more interesting, uh, who's coming in the door. I'm just going to <laughs> stare into someone's eyes, not in a creepy way, but yeah, I'm going to no, connect, yeah, yeah. connect and really ask interesting, genuine questions and shut my mouth. And I started doing this this first night and people, and I did it with like a, a joyful energy, right? Like a childlike curiosity. I was just like really curious. I was it's like, wow. And I would, and I would do a follow up question. Oh, tell me more about that. Tell me more. That's interesting. How did this happen with this? And at the end of the night, people came up to me like, you got to meet Lewis. He's such an interesting guy. <laughs> he's so cool. He's so, he's so interesting, but they didn't know anything about me. I never shared anything about me. I was so curious about them. And I realized right then, I was like, oh, to be interesting, you have to be interested in other yeah. people. Yeah, 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 and yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can build incredible relationships by showing how much you care, how interested you are in people, and make it about them as opposed to making it about you. Yeah. And that was essentially what I started doing. I said, okay, I'm just going to use this insecurity of not feeling like I'm smart enough. Lean into it. Use the things I am good at, which is curiosity, joy, I'm passionate, I'm playful, I'm, you know, I'll yeah, joke yeah, with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just try to make people feel connected and feel like their story is really inspiring, which it is to me. And that is kind of what I did with the, the podcast. It's just like, okay, you're way smarter than me, right? You've got these skills, this experience that I don't have. Let me be fascinated. Now, I've interrupted you and I'm talking right now, but in general, it's, it's like, well, tell me more. That's interesting. Well, how, do I, how can I use this in my life, you know? Yeah, and you, you threw out inadvertently like a couple of different like superpowers, um, curiosity. Uh -huh. Like, uh, you know, we got a block of instruction we teach called caviar. The scene caviar is curiosity. It's about getting yourself in the right headspace. Uh, and the scene Nicholas Tyler wrote a book, Anti Fragile. He says curiosity is an anti fragile characteristic. Mm. And curiosity is a highly positive frame of mind. Mm -hmm. um, I cite this guy's TED talk so many times. The happiness advantage, Sean yeah. Acker. Yeah. He says you're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind. Curiosity is highly positive. There's all, every, everybody in all these different places talk about curiosity as an avenue to success for a variety of reasons. You pick up more, you're interested, you pay attention. The other person feels very connected with yes. when you're genuinely curious. Playful, mm -hmm. high, another highly positive frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Kotler talks about flow, Stephen Kotler. Mm -hmm. Says flow is highly positive, even playful. Pre-adolescents walk around essentially in borderline flow all the time. Yes. They're playful. Jumping around, trying, you know, climbing on people, you're just singing, dancing, you're just playing. Yeah, yeah. And so you take that attitude into a business environment and suddenly everybody else, everybody there is going like, hey, this kid over here with this, <laughs> with this old sport coat yeah, and exactly. tennis shoes yeah. is the most interesting character here. Yeah, right. Come over and meet this guy. Uh-huh. Anybody can do that. Yes. If they, uh, yeah, if they go like, all right, so I'm an idiot and I don't have any credentials and I don't <laughs> know anything and I'm unemployable because I have no skills. Let me go out and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, how are you going to go down from there? Yeah, you can't. How are you going to embarrass yourself? You're going to be like, all right, so I am a goofball. Let me yeah. go in here and I'll be a goofball and I'll be happy. And, and figure out a way to bring value in your unique way. I'm curious, what is the most frequent question word that you use who what when where why ah all right um all right so we only use questions to create calibrate thinking in the other person's brain mm. to start with like i'm not going to ask you a question to get information i'm going to ask you a question to put a thought in your head for example when i'm working on a free upgrade to a suite in a hotel mm -hmm. which i work on every time I don't get every time. What's your success rate? Practice. What's your success rate? The success rate is probably in excess of 90%. Really? Which is also going to be, it's going to be impacted by inventory. Right. If there's no inventory and there's really no inventory, it's... They can't give you a suite they don't have. But maybe they can give you something else. Or, you know, they're going to look at their inventory. The first thing, do they have any suites? The second, how many nights in a row do I want a suite? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm rolling in there and I'm almost always late because I'm traveling. Sure. If they only got one suite, I'm staying one night and it's after six. They could give me that one suite. They can use up their inventory because I'm out in the morning. And at six o'clock at night, they're, they're willing to gamble that nobody's coming in and taking it. Now, if I'm there for three nights, 
I'm not getting that suite. Mm. If that's the only one they have, because they got to leave it open. So, but I got to ask in a way that doesn't limit me to the suite. Right. Because I want them, get it. I want them to feel good about the interaction. So throw other stuff on the table. Like I, I'm in a I'm in a hotel in uh, in Dallas probably about a year ago. I didn't think about it until I walked in the door. Um, parking lot's full of Range Rovers. I walk inside. There are no shortage of women that are dressed to the nines. Mm-hmm. Almost all of them are company. But I mean, dressed to impress. I get up to the counter and I do the sweet thing and the guy's like, yeah, we got a wedding party here. Uh. Range Rovers, expensive. Expensive outfits. Are they out of sweets? More than likely. Right. So I do the pitch. He's like, man, you know, we got a wedding party here. They're taking all the sweets. So I asked him in the morning the question, is it a ridiculous idea for you to make it up to me at the bar? Uh, <laughs> now think about the absurdity of that question. Yeah. Like I'm asking, <laughs> I'm asking for something for free <laughs> that I never should have had in the first place. And if you don't give it to me, now you got to make it up to me? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I like That's that. That's hysterical. That's great. And so a guy goes, no, 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 As a matter of fact, and he comes around the counter and he gives me like five, six free drink tickets at the bar. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, That's I, I got cool. to leave myself in a position to get other stuff. What's the go-to approach for anyone trying to get an upgrade? Well, so first of all. For a car upgrade, uh, hotel well, it's not, upgrade. It's not, you got to understand, since it's not about you, how do they see it? And so, and then, like, it's an emotional journey. Uh-huh. And, it, and the journey is how it ends, not how it begins. Mm. You know, the last impression is the last impression. I got to take them to this great place. That's going to be three steps. Give it to me. Now, in, in, a, in, a, in a hotel, I'm going to be like, look, man, I'm getting ready to ruin your whole day. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing you say. Well, you, you got to give me your ID. Right, right, right. They got to Credit they, card, you, ID. They got to find your reservation. Right. Because they're going to be distracted. They're going to be multitasking. So they say, hey, you're checking in? Check yeah, in, I'm checking yeah, in. Find a reservation. If you if you got a points number, you give them the points number. You got to wait for the moment, and you go like, "I'm getting ready to ruin your day." Now, and you got to stop, and you got to wait. They tell you to go on. Now, from a hotel, <laughs> from the hotel's perspective, <laughs> like they have seen every horrible thing you could imagine. Oh, I'm sure. You know, Chaos. do you have a goat in your bag, <laughs> and you want to do a satanic ritual sacrifice right, in a right, room, right. which we are never going to be able to get that out of the walls? Yeah, exactly. Like they, they've seen crazy, every crazy parties, thing. you know, animal f- feces, whatever <laughs> yeah, it is, everything. yeah, everything. So when you say that, they immediately go to all this horrible stuff. No, because you're going <laughs> to take you're going to take them to a better place. So you say first, are you ready for me to? Uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to ruin your day. Oh man! And you let that sink in. And and then they go and then so now you got you start bringing them out of it. <laughs> how are you going to say? How are you going to seem to them if you're somebody who's asking for stuff for free? Uh huh. You're cheap, right? You're another cheap, yes. entitled, self-centered traveler who's demanding. And so I'm like, I'm sure. Again, it's not uh, it's not a denial. It's an admission. A prediction. I'm sure. I'm going to seem like another self-centered, unappreciative, demanding traveler who thinks the sun rises and sets on him, (laughs) who wants something for nothing. Now, you no longer have a goat in your suitcase. Uh Uh-huh. No, ritual sacrifice is not involved. You want some for free. Yes. They immediately start to feel better and believe. (laughs) Yes. Now, you, because you asked me about questions. Uh Uh-huh. So now we get to the question to create a state of mind. The last obstacle is going to be how much trouble are they going to get into uh-huh. if they give me a free suite upgrade. Now, they, either, there's a colleague standing there. The, I've done this while the boss was the standing manager, there. manager, yeah. I've done this literally while the manager was standing next to listening to this whole thing. They may need to go find a manager. Mm-hmm. So how much trouble am I going to get you in? If I ask for a free upgrade to a suite. Because the last thing that's going to go through their mind that they have to reconcile before they make the move is whether or not they're going to get in any trouble. Mm-hmm. I lay this out in one hotel in New York. And there's a woman standing next because you're almost always going to get it in front of somebody. 
This works in front of other employees. It works in front of customers. You don't got to be in a vacuum. And the boss jumps in and says, because you asked nicely, let me see what I can do. Mm. She starts checking the inventory. Wow. I want to be there for four nights. And she says, look, if you can guarantee me that when you check out on Friday, you're out of here before 10 o'clock in the morning, I got an upgrade for you, but I got, I got late checkout problems on Friday morning. You cannot have a late checkout. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> you, <gotta be laughs> yeah. you got it. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll come down in my pajamas if yeah. I got to get out of there in time. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. So the three steps is I'm getting ready to ruin your day. I'm getting Some type of approach day. of. Because what are you getting ready to do? You're getting yeah. ready to give them something negative. Yes. And the second one is acknowledging that you're coming across as another greedy, demanding customer that expects the world to open up for them and have something for free. And then the third one is, tell me the third the step again. question, how much trouble am I going to get you in if I ask you a free upgrade to a suite? Mm -hmm. Now, and this, like this emotional journey, and really um, the point is always leaving people better than you found them. And, you know, they've been through a lot. Like, they want to help you. If they would love to help you, the first thing is, do you appreciate what it is for them? Like, this, this poor schmuck behind the counter. <laughs> He's getting yelled at by everybody. Everyone. You know, and, 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 and everybody's going for a free upgrade. And, you know, I had a friend of mine who had this really entertaining one, but the success rate was really low. You know, he's telling me, he says, you mean to tell me if the President of the United States wasn't coming in here tonight, you wouldn't have a suite? Mm. And the clerk says, of course we would. So, well, President ain't coming. Give it to me. Right. Now, that's really entertaining. But it left the guy resentful. Mm -hmm. like, like one hotel I'm in where I get the upgrade for several nights, an hour after I check into the room, my plans change dramatically. I got to check out the following morning. I'm not staying two nights. Mm. Now, by and large, they are completely entitled, based on the terms of the contract, to charge me for the second night. Right. You know, I've agreed to that. I go down the next morning and I said, look, I am so sorry. This is my problem. This is not your problem. Because it was my problem. And mm -hmm. if I asked to check out without getting charged, their first reaction was like, look, dude, that's your problem. That's the bad planning on your part is not constituted an emergency yeah. for me. Yeah, we're a business. We got stuff to do too. You screwed up. Why should we pay? So that's what they're going to think. So I, they're going to think it's my problem. So I've left them with a really positive residue from the day before because they felt great about helping me out. And I said, look, I'm sorry. It's my problem. I go, no, what, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? I go, my plans have changed. I, I got to check out. I got I to gotta go home. And I'm like, oh, no, no worries. No worries. We'll get uh. you out of here. What can we do? I mean, leaving, because even after the deal, you always need some sort of collaboration from, from somebody. You're mm -hmm. going to need something. It doesn't matter what it is. And even if you don't need something, you want them to feel like they helped you, they felt good about helping you. Right. You know, the hotel staff, they realized that you could give them a great social media review as a result, mm -hmm. which is going to be really good for their business. They don't want to get clobbered over the head. They don't want to say, well, I'm an influencer, and if you give me a free upgrade, I will broadcast it to all of my 75 followers on Instagram right. that this is a great hotel. Like, everybody thinks they're an influencer. Yeah. Well, they want that. They just don't want to get clubbed with it. Mm -hmm. So if they liked helping you just because something about the interaction, instead of making them feel uneasy, made them feel like they collaborated with another human being that saw their challenges... Then all that other stuff that you want to use as primary is now great fringe benefit, social media, commentary. Yes. I'm going to put a video on my Instagram mm -hmm. about how cool the room is or how great the view is. Or I'm in downtown Detroit and how revitalized downtown Detroit is. And this phenomenal hotel suite that I'm in that I'm like, I'll, I'll move in here. This is yeah. so nice. <laughs> You know, so I'll put that out there, uh -huh. but I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want them to. I don't want to use it against them. I don't want to leverage it against yes. them. I want it. I want them to feel like I did it because I wanted to, and because it was mutual gain. Yeah. It, it's like it's like anything. You could take something that's meant to be positive and twist it, but I'll tell you this: when you come from a genuine place, 
people feel it. Mm -hmm. They feel it. When you are doing it with the goal to manipulate people, people feel that too.